It's time for Mac Break Weekly, and of course, the the story of the week: Apple versus Epic, and in an, an epic knockdown. Now Apple's pulling their developer keys. What does this mean for users of the Unreal Engine? And who is looking worse in this fight? It is uh, uh, something to talk about. We're also going to talk about some brand new things from Apple, including new Apple Music stations, a new deal on Apple Care, and a new bundle. All that coming up next on Mac Break Weekly. Mac Break Weekly comes to you from Twit's LastPass Studios, securing every access point in your company. Doesn't have to be a challenge. LastPass unifies access and authentication to make securing your employees simple and secure, even when they're working remotely. Check out lastpass.com slash twit to learn more. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This is Mac Break Weekly, episode 727, recorded Tuesday, August 18th, 2020. Most of a burrito. This episode of Mac Break Weekly is brought to you by Roman. Skip the waiting room and awkward face-to-face. -face. Get ED medication conveniently delivered to your door in discreet, unmarked packaging. Go to GetRoman.com slash MacBreak for a free online visit and free two-day shipping. It's time for Mac Break Weekly, the show where we cover the latest news from Apple. Oh, lordy, is there news. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the usual uh, team is in town. Renee Ritchie from YouTube.com slash Renee Ritchie. Hello, RR. Ar, 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 ar. Hello, Leo. I'm suing everybody. I, I'm tired of this. I've got, I'm it's going to the over. Supreme Court. I'm, Dude. everyone is out of order. This whole, yeah, yeah, it's just, I'm done. I'm just suing everybody. I'm through. He says, I'm through. Uh, do you play Fortnite? I need, I need, we need a Fortnite expert on the panel. I have played Fortnite. I have played Fortnite too. I am familiar with Fortnite. I am familiar, but I don't have any of the dance moves down. It's PUBG <laughs> on the Unreal Engine is my understanding. Perfect. Ooh, ouch. <laughs> Perfect. Also, Andy Anako is here. WGBH in Boston's Andy Anako, wearing a fight, 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 a stunning Star Wars shirt. I might add. I Thank like you. that. It's got Tie Fighters. Is that an at at? It's got Tie Fighters. It's got Rebel Alliance symbols. <laughs> it's got all terrain air, air transports, and lots of them. Oh, it does. It also has the. Uh, imperial cogs it is oh. it, it's it's the it's the old I, I i am old school enough that like if there's a piece of like uh, star wars related clothing that i like but it has like any of the symbols from like the new films i'm like uh, i don't want that nah. yeah yeah, yeah. I, what, what i films? like about that is it it doesn't pick sides <laughs> you <can> be, yeah, exactly <laughs> you could be empire rebel alliance doesn't matter it's okay it doesn't pick sides. It's a very only only a only a Sith believes in absolutes. Yes, it's a very ecumenical <laughs> shirt. Also here, Lori Gill. It's good to see Lori in a, a new setting. She looks. Uh, she's Back actually all she's done is is rotate her iMac 180 degrees. And I, I think I've got um, Andy beat because I've got my, like my permanent. This is my permanent Star Wars. So I think I got whoa. You beat. <laughs> That's commitment. <laughs> oh, I didn't know you had that. Show that to us again. That's <laughs> this cool. This is actually Boba Fett's chest plate yeah. insignia. So most of the symbols will usually show that Mandalorian symbol, but that's what he has on his oh chest. Oh, my plate, God. So. Do you have geek cred? <laughs> I've I been mean, a fan of, of Boba Fett for a long time. That immediately... <laughs> That immediately puts you right up there in the in the geek pants. You rescued him from the Sarlacc pit. That's I'm why he's around today. today. I've seen you know I've seen little Rebel Alliance. You know somebody that's not that's not commitment. You put a little Rebel Alliance on your that's not commitment on the web. Of your, Although I would argue on your hand well, is it's way more, more obvious than on your shoulder. You could never so. yeah you could never invade the Death Star because they just go well, what is that? <laughs> yeah. Like, no, no. Now, now, now the symbol of being all in is: did you do, did you have it done in all black ink, which can be easily removed by laser, oh, or did you incorporate no. red, which is impossible to remove oh, by laser? Is that is that? <laughs> yeah. See, I, I'm learning yep. so much about uh, about uh, tattoos. So we're being happy go lucky because right now <laughs> a shooting war is about to break out between uh, <laughs> Apple and Epic. And I am going to I'm going to stay above the fray for a moment because I'm a little heated about all of this. 
Um, and Google, yeah. Let's not forget, it's a three-way fight. Yeah, Google, I don't think I'm not, you know. Okay, so here's, here's the deal you all know, but I'm just going to give you a quick uh, recapitulation. So for those who uh, don't, on Thursday, Epic launched a missile. I mean, it really had clearly planned to begin this war. It knew. It had a 30-page court pleading prepared. It had a 1984-style movie made. Um, they put... They replaced the in-app purchases on at first on iOS and then on the Google Play Store uh, with a, a mechanism that would get around it so that you could buy credits from Epic directly and not pay the 30% to Apple or Google. Uh, both Apple and Google immediately responded by pulling Fortnite from the Play Store. Now, Fortnite is a free game, but the in-app purchases have been very successful. They've made Tim Sweeney and Epic... Billions and billions of dollars. I think Sweeney so made $7 successful. billion dollars last year in the Fortnite DLC stuff. You know, dance moves, outfits, all of that stuff. It's very successful. People love it. It's a great game. Not And by the way, it's not exclusive to iOS or Android. It's probably much more played on PC or consoles. Uh, in fact, they even pay the 30% to both Sony and Microsoft for, uh, for in-game uh, app purchases uh, in their stores. So then they didn't pull it there. But remember that Tim Sweeney had started this fight when they first uh, put Epic uh, Fortnite on uh, Google Play or on, on Android. They decided not to go through the Google Play Store. They said, well, you can sideload it because we don't want to give them 30 uh, percent. But it turned out to be a little more a a little more complicated and be a little more risky to do the side loading. In fact, it didn't launch well. Somebody, uh, some hacker was able to get in, insert malware into the downloads initially. So um, eventually they joined the Google Play Store. Apple's response and Google's response, as I said, to pull the game down. But then Apple this week went one step further and perhaps a step too far. Epic sued immediately. And uh, what Apple's response to that was, they sued Apple and Google. Uh, was to yank or threaten to yank, it'll go, be in effect August 28th, Epic's developer credentials, which means no Epic properties could be updated in the App Store, including the, apparently, according to Epic, the Unreal Engine. The Unreal Engine is not only used for Fortnite, it's used for many, many iOS games. And those game developers would be put on the spot. They would either have to replace the Unreal Engine, which is not really doable, or not be able to update their apps ever again. And or Epic could release it unsigned, but they'd have to give up their own signing privileges to do that. So, so that's, make what, it a worse so that's where I want to begin, because I know that both you and Lori have dug deep into this and Andy have dug deep into this. Epic says that by doing that, this retaliatory move, they have jeopardized Unreal Engine and in the legal document, they immediately filed for injunctive relief from the courts. In the, in the document, they said, if the Unreal Engine can no longer support Apple platforms, the software developers that use it will be forced to use alternatives. The damage to Epic's ongoing business and to its reputation and trust with its customers will be unquantifiable and irreparable. Preliminary injunctive relief is necessary to prevent Apple from crushing Epic before this case could ever get to judgment. Is it the case that yanking the developer credentials, is that the effect it would have, Renee? So can I sort of preface this quickly by saying that all the legal stuff is posturing. Like everyone is, is taking the most extreme position possible to sort of make the most extreme case possible. And I truly do believe that all of them sincerely think that they are in the right and are rationalizing their behavior by telling us that they're doing it all for us. And there is a lot of like just so much, all the money at stake. So technically, they have they are they are both both Apple and Epic are are using like the Obi Wan Kenobi version of the truth, where it's from a certain point of view. Like Apple is saying, it's a level playing field for all the apps, and this is in Apple's agreement. It says well, let me, that if you let violate me give you, this, let me give you Apple's uh, response from last night. The App sure. Store is designed to be a safe and tr just so that everybody gets their pleadings app. The Apple Store is designed to be a safe and trusted place for users and a great business opportunity for all developers. Epic has been one of the most successful developers on the App Store, 
undeniably true, growing into a multi-billion dollar business that reaches millions of iOS customers around the world. We very much want to keep the company as part of the Apple developer program and their apps on the store. The problem Epic has created for itself is one that can be easily remedied if they submit an update of their app that reverts it to comply with the guidelines they agreed to and which apply to all developers. We won't make an exception for Epic because we don't think it's right to put their business interests ahead of the guidelines that protect our customers. But, but it seems to me that still would be true. But the minute they yank developer, is that part of the agreement? That yeah, that's in the agreement. It says that you yeah you you, you if you, you at first they give you a time period to fix it and then you lose your okay. And but most developers that's fine because they just can't put their app up. But Epic, I think both Apple and Epic forget in this that they are responsible for a huge dependency it's for an many ecosystem. other developer. Yeah, and if either Apple or Epic does anything to justify to jeopardize the Unreal Engine, it's not just them who suffer. Epic could release it as unsigned. You can still we talked about this before. You can go in do a terminal command. It reveals a little button that says don't like turn off Gatekeeper and you can still install Unreal. But I believe Unreal lets you sign applications with your certificate inside their app and they they require certification to be able to do that part of it. So it would just make it uh, – it's already a really tough uh, – Brianna Rue was pitting about how tough the, the procedure is. It's already really tough to spit out a, a finalized app and it would just make it that much tougher. And Epic, as we see from their pleading against Google, they hate the idea of sideloading. It's just not – they don't think normal people do it. Mm. So, and you can't sideload on iOS. So, it's the, no, you can on Mac though. So that's the developer part that people were concerned about. You, so, you if can they lose the developer under, credentials, like, uh, it affects the the game developers downloading and installing Unreal Engine on their Mac in, in order to make an version, iOS yeah. app. It doesn't doesn't impinge on the iOS app itself. It's merely they can't get updates on it, updating it. Yeah. Well, they can, but they'd have to go through the same sideloading process that Epic says is so egregious on Android. So it, it, basically they contend that, like, again, normal people don't sideload. Apple and Google make it seem so scary when you do it, and they effectively block you by not making it the default status and use things like Google Protect and Gatekeeper to make like to make it almost effectively impossible, in their wording, to do it. So they, they want full access without having to go through that procedure. So it just it struck me, at least the optics of it, uh, this second blow it's all bad. really looked like <laughs> yeah. from a, for Apple, I think. Well, maybe that's just my point of view. But for Apple, the optics of saying, hey, you got a nice ecosystem you got here. It'd be a shame if anything happened to it. Um, Lori, no. is this is this what I mean, how are regular people going to react to this? I think they're going to react like I did. They don't know what the agreement is. They're going to say, Apple, <laughs> you are being dicks. Or is it epic? Well, no, they're going to say um, Epic Games has really done a good do job of marketing this as the, the tyrannical overlord that is Apple and to a lesser degree Google are the ones who are doing everything wrong here. The average person is not going to see this as um, Apple, you know, trying to adhere to its guidelines. They're not going to see Epic as having done something wrong. Um, it's definitely, and unfortunately, Apple is the one who's looking the worst in this case, even though Google is doing the exact same thing, too. Um, See, Google Apple is the one getting the more is the less bigger of, headline. Google's less of a monopoly because you, you can sideload. Apple prohibits yeah. that, says you cannot do that. And they're not that. a development platform. Nobody's writing Unreal apps using their Android phone. They're doing it on Windows or they're doing it on mm -hmm. Mac. Yeah. Also, they're a lot less stringent about collecting 30% on every transaction that that happens within the ecosystem. So, not on um, games though. Two, In games, they're identical to Apple. Right. <laughs> right. But but the, but their their argument at Epic is that this is a universal thing that is just no good and shouldn't be allowed. Although let's let's also say let's also admit that uh, what part of the fun is that they that Epic didn't just do like a search a search and replace Google and Apple uh, when they uh, filed the lawsuit <laughs> against Google. Google's lawsuit <laughs> specifically calls out. Oh, but didn't you, and, and every time every time I I, I want to say this I want to use like the, the the southern sweaty country lawyer like voice. And you are founded upon the principle that <laughs> that <laughs> we don't do evil. Well, what have you what have you to say about this now, sir? Uh, but they uh, part of the part of the lawsuit against uh, Google mentions that, for instance, uh, Epic tried to try to uh, get a deal with uh, OnePlus, for instance, to put the Epic Game Store preloaded on all of their phones. 
but was that the that and that had they had a deal in place but google for instance but google stepped in and said to oneplus we would very much like for you not to do this deal and the deal was kibosh so this is this is this underscores the fact that this was not uh, for pe people on twitter and other social media that are saying oh well this is a stupid lawsuit it can't possibly proceed that that has the idea that uh, that this was something that they did impulsively as opposed to something they built month by month over over a period mm -hmm. of a year yeah. to make sure that whatever mm -hmm. arguments they make I mean they they, they have Christine Varney as the as as part of their co-counsel for uh, to for explain and to Christine. me how this makes customers safer how what makes customers safer this 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 is Apple's response we're yeah, trying to make so Apple, it, trying to make Apple customers it safer. It's, we've proven yeah. that it's not like they've handled transactions, and this is part of Epic's complaint. They've handled transactions for Amazon. When you buy non-digital goods, transactions are handled through the vendor, not through Apple, and those are secure. And when you you install apps using Gatekeeper, and when you install apps using side-loading on Android, this is Android, Apple says we won't secure. make an exception for Epic because we don't think it's right to put their business interests ahead of the guidelines that protect the our clause, customers. Though. And yeah, in fact, they should say we don't think it's right for them to put their business interests ahead of our business yeah. interests. That's yeah. the truth. Well, no, but and this is why it hurts Apple. This there. is why it hurts Apple because, yeah, they have the right to do this. It's in the agreement. It looks terrible. It looks because it followed on after the lawsuit. They said, well, in that case, no developer license for you, and we're going to hurt an entire ecosystem of people. And you can't make the argument, despite Apple's statement, that it's protecting customers. It's protecting our bottom line. And I think the optics on this could not be worse. Whether I mean, Apple like, has merit, whether it's doing the right thing, whether you can argue that they've added so much value that it's and 30% is the norm and all that stuff, doesn't matter. Because the normal person is going to look at this and say, what dicks? Mm -hmm. I did a poll right after this. Um, and I used YouTube instead of Twitter because I wanted an, uh, like an extra answer. But after the Microsoft thing, the streaming game thing we talked about last week, almost nobody was on Apple's side. Like e even in my audience, who I'm assuming are vastly composed of, of real ardent Apple enjoyers, <laughs> whatever you want to call them. In this case, most of them are don't like Epic. And I don't know if that's just because they don't like Epic or they think Epic started it and in their mind starting it is the is the original sin. But the and what I'm just seeing in the Apple tech community is yes, there's a bunch of people who have their their Apple monopolist um, rent seeking signs. Absolutely. But there are a bunch of people who said that, you know, they knew the agreement and they broke it. And yes, this thing sucks, but it wasn't the right way to do it. And now it's us, the customers who suffer. So I, I think they all look bad. I, I don't think the App Store is doing the right thing here. I don't there's a whole bunch of things about Epic that is deeply problematic. Um, so I, this is not the Batman I want to be fighting Apple in this case <laughs> at all. I'd much rather it be a much better, a much, a much more ethically run company. But uh, I think Apple's position there is like, just shut up, take it down, and then come back and talk to us in two weeks, much like people handle international incidents. I've, Apple's just <laughs> acting like a mafioso here. Well, this, well, this, this is, is I think this is a... Go ahead, Laurie. This is a situation where, uh, like... This has been coming up and coming up in in the in the news and in tech in the tech world a lot recently, and I think this is where Apple is making a stand. Is that they're what they're doing from their perspective is we're proving to you and we're proving to the government that we treat all app developers the same. This is what we've been claiming we do, and we're doing this, and we're even doing it to the biggest game company, the biggest mobile game company in the world. So if we would stand on our laurels and say that epic has to has to go along with it then you then we are clearly doing what we claim to be doing which is treating all developers the same now i don't believe that they do i do i believe that apple it's it's a complicated situation where not all developers are treated the same but i think this is why apple is making such a strong stand with this particular gaming company with this particular company you, you can win in court, and probably Apple will win in court, but if you lose in the court of public opinion, I don't know if that's a victory. They'll win in court and lose. So the current law, they'll probably win because, the, the so at least in the U.S., the EU, it's a totally different question. But in the in the U.S., they've been pretty stringent up to the Supreme Court that you you don't interfere with deals. Like, there's, there's no duty to deal. You can make business decisions that you want. But we, as we saw with Congress, this is exactly, exactly what Congress was, was getting mad at Apple about. And again, 
it's just it's so ho- high profile. And I think both Epic and Apple are asking or claiming the most extreme position they possibly can as a negotiation point. But it's I, I don't think it'll end well for any of them. And it's not going to end well for the customers. And I wish that they would stop using us as ways to rationalize their positions and actually reverse engineer it come out with the outcome and then figure out how to get there because there's a lot of people who are super, super upset about what's going on. Epic uh, has chosen this time carefully. You know, they watched what happened yeah. with the hey mail email thing right before WWDC. Apple did back down a little bit. They were able to work something out. Uh, now Epic is trying to build a coalition of other app store uh, complainants like Sonos and Spotify uh, to help fight this. You know, I... I think it, if you really get into the weeds of it, Epic is just as much at fault as Apple. Epic probably just should say, yeah, we're just not going to make it for iOS or, or Android. And, uh, you know, let the, let the children beg Apple and Google to, to do it. I think Epic really wants to do a store. That's what they've done. They've yes. created a yeah. Steam in the competitor uh, on PCs, and they'd like to create an uh, iOS uh, yeah. app store competitor on iOS. And I'm sure that's what Apple does not want them to do. But I think it feels to me like these guys could get together and work out something. Or no, is I, that impossible? This I is, think they this could. Is I, think, this, I, I think this is definitely a fight that was brewing for years, that this was not something that was going to be settled uh, in a conference room. This was definitely something that was going to have to be settled uh, by the courts at some point. Uh, the Apple was sort of, Apple and Google uh, were sort of begging for a court case to come up. They just didn't know exactly who would pull the trigger and when it would happen. Uh, and we also have to confront the fact that although they do, although Epic does have an uphill battle, um, be, chiefly because this is a, uh, they're, they're, they're alleging a, what's called a single market uh, majority uh, or sing, a single market, uh, uh, basically, it, it, it typically doesn't work to say that if you have a, if you have a, 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 an isolated platform like this, that to have to have a monopoly on this platform is to have what is antitrust regulators would uh, identify as a monopoly. So in a civil case, this is going to be a problem. But remember that even if Apple does beat this back, and I'm sure they're going to they're going to win it at some point, they still have they still might lose it uh, at the at the California state level. They still have to deal with the Department of Justice. They still have to deal with yeah. uh, the FTC. They still have to deal with 50 state uh, uh, district attorneys. Uh, that are uh, that are uh, going for similar antitrust stuff. They're st they still have to deal with EU, which is which is also hammering them on the exact same things. This is something that w there was always going to be a period of a year or two in which Apple was going to have to adjust their App Store guidelines, or actually the way they run that entire business, to make sure it conforms to the 2020 version of yeah. what governments are willing to allow and what they are not willing to allow. And it just seems to be happening right now it seems to me like it was a mistake to sue google like i think that when they first sued apple right away they had a lot of support or at least I, when i was watching on twitter i was trying to track the sentiment they had a lot of support and people were like why didn't you sue xbox why didn't you sue sony why didn't you sue nintendo they all do the 30 percent but when they sued google as well because google is more open they do allow yeah again granted not for games but they do allow things like side loading i think at that point that their goal of getting their store where they operate functionally very similar to apple like you know they, they take 12 percent, but they don't offer as much as google and apple clearly because they, well, they think what Google offered was so valuable, a, they wouldn't do side loading to do There's it. a precedent for that on, on Android. Samsung has a store. Uh, there are yes, plenty, of, the there are plenty store. of third party stores on Android. Yeah. So that's not the issue there. But not inside Google Play. They're, no. They're, they're vendor stores. It's not like right. uh, it, it, it's harder to get them on, not, on, on a device that you're like the Samsung store on LG is not really a thing, as far as I know. No, that's right. <laughs> Uh, but I don't think it would be hard if, if you have some serious fans to put an Epic Store on uh, on Google. But you absolutely could not have an Epic Store on iOS. Mm -hmm. And it's complicated because yeah. Tencent owns 40% of it. Sony owns 1.4% of it. They have a developer deal with Nintendo that's beyond what the sort yeah. of basic app design thing. So, like, again, Epic is not the Batman I wanted to go to war with. John, on Gruber, I think they make it messier, John Gruber thinks Epic will blink. And he's got a point. He says... 
uh, you know, consumers, gamers may blame Apple for this, but developers who are using the Unreal Engine are going to blame Epic. Yeah. They're going to say, you are screwing us. You're really risking our business entirely here because it's not practical to move to a different engine. No. You're not going to be able to do that. And so, they blinked last time. They will blink yeah, because be, they have to blink because um, it's... It's not necessarily the people using Fortnite. It's the, all these people using the Unreal Engine. That's an important business uh, to Epic. And yeah. these people and are going to be mad as hell. It's a vulnerability that other companies wouldn't have. Like Spotify doesn't have to deal with that. Right. Nobody's developing with the Spotify right. engine. They can sue Apple this way as much as they want. And, and, and Gruber says, look, it's actually easy to, for Epic to save face, to say, all right, Apple made us do this. Uh, mm -hmm. So we're going to raise the cost of V-Bucks because it's Apple. That 30% goes to Apple now. Sorry, kids. Blame Apple, and then the court case will continue to wind. That's a good strategy. I mean, this whole thing got so much attention. If they were to do that, it would just put more. Like they would take off whatever taint they currently have. They would redouble the pressure on Apple, like making them look like even more jerks. I think that would that would be a huge win for them, PR wise. Well, the the, the lose there is that they'd be required to re to raise their prices on every platform, wouldn't they? To to, to I don't if think their so goal anymore. is to. Really? Apple would make them do that? Doesn't Apple say? Yeah, because Spotify was doing is does thirty percent more on iOS than they do outside. Oh, really? I think now. Uh, I thought that I thought okay, maybe maybe a, maybe a knowledge of the data. I knew that at some point they had a requirement that said that you can't offer yes, a deal yeah, to right. to iOS people that is not the same as deals on other people. You can't have a so, better deal somewhere else. I think else. that changed yeah. a couple years ago. I'll have to double check. Okay. But also to go back and address uh, uh, Epic's relationships with game platformers, they have uh, they haven't addressed this in the context of this lawsuit. But a couple of years ago, at least, the CEO was uh, was talking about this and saying essentially saying that they're getting far far more from their relationships with Sony and Nintendo and the rest in the fact that they are investing in their platform. They're getting co marketing. They're going. They're getting co promotional uh, benefits. Whereas from Apple, all they're getting is the ability to sell apps in the store, and they feel as though that's not enough for their 30%. Yeah. So. <laughs> well, this was a play they did against I, Steam, right? Like they made their own store to specifically to go after Steam and then started signing exclusives to keep them away from Steam. So uh, they, they, I think they know how to run the, we want to, we want to be the platform play. It's a really yeah. interesting uh, position. And as I said last week, the, the company that really, should be suing is Microsoft because they want to put xCloud. But they don't yeah. have to because I think people are just going to say, hey, how come I can't run xCloud on uh, iOS? And Apple said because it's a store. And they're probably negotiating rather than suing. Yeah. yeah. And, and and also this is a market that they don't have yet. Epic is trying to protect a market that they've already proven is very, very Good successful. Point. So they have Good a different point. kind of motivation. But this remember that this is, this is much bigger, I think, than just the 30%. Uh, like I said earlier, I really think that there was always going to be building a, a pressure point where Apple would have to start n either negotiating or at least explaining everything about how they operate the App Store and everything about their relationship with developers. One of the things that I've always found like a big thumb in the eye to developers is that they could often simply say that, hi, I know that your app has nothing, really won't benefit from this new API that we're putting in. However, we're going to insist that you can't push any updates into the store unless you're supporting this new API. And your and time is money. That Instead of uh, these developers putting in new features that they know that their users want, now we're going to have to make sure that this will work with conceivably a round iPhone, even though we really have no idea of whether or not this is going to ship or whether we want this to happen. We would much rather have search and replace, which is something that we haven't been doing for the past two or three years, are bad. But we really want to put search and replace in our in our app. We don't want to have to support something that Apple simply is saying that we're only doing because Apple will not allow us to update our app otherwise. This, these are all kinds of little steps of control here that Apple is insisting upon. And it's important that they be uh, they deal with this by making an argument in front of a neutral third party with legal authority instead of putting out a press release once again saying, hey, two hippies in a garage, uh, you know, wheels for the mind. Remember that? We, we just want the best thread. experience for our users. There was a great thread from a German developer whose name I'm blanking on, which was the opposite of his argument saying, I don't mind paying the 30 percent, but I Apple needs to hold up their end of it. Like there can't like I can't be paying this 30 percent and have these dumb search ads and have you not have, have put test flight here and have you have the worst subscription implementation of anyone in the modern industry. And like and just went through the list of things that Apple is either 
badly implemented, hasn't implemented, or has otherwise made their lives difficult and saying, if you want my 30%, I'm happy to give it to you. But like, instead of saying my rent is too high, it's like, you've got to fix my apartment. Yeah. I thought that was yeah, this thing counter. This, this is this has been my uh, my reaction to a lot of the conversations that I've been seeing. That a lot of people they seem to be taking the the point of view that God, the, all these companies are lucky to have a wonderful company like Apple providing them with something as transform transformational as the App Store and a platform as wonderful as iOS to develop on. So, no, that's not the that's not how business works. Like these, the Apple delivers a lot of benefits to developers, but developers by creating the kind of apps that define the iPhone experience, they also provide a big benefit for Apple. This is, uh, is it, this is an unequal partnership to be sure, but it has to be a partnership. So there's, there's a something to be said. Go ahead. There's something to be said for Apple sort of in this, this sort of idea of a utopia that, that your company can grow and, and get bigger and make a better profit, you know, more revenue, um, and that, like, that's like this sort of consumer-based dream, right? The American dream, if you will, that you can just keep doing these things. But when you're beholden to another company for your company's ability to grow, it that, that really does kind of put a, a big block wall in front of in front of that. You know, so for Epic Games, they can't have an a, a store within a store no matter what, even if they have the best store in the world and it makes tons and tons of money and it's the future of Epic Games and it's the future of gaming, they don't get to do that on one of the most popular platforms in the world. So there's there's this roadblock that goes up for, you know, I, I, I do think that Epic is doing this wrong, but I think the sentiment behind what they're doing makes a lot of sense of that you don't like they don't get to grow they like there's there's a stopping point where growth doesn't get to happen anymore because of these two phone companies that dominate the operating systems around the world and that does that seems imbalanced to me yeah the counter argument to that and i'm not i, I for me, it's a lot of balanced things. Like when Apple created the App Store, and I'm guessing when Google Play created the Play Store, it was in an era where there were monster software companies dominating, like the sh literally the shelf space. And one of the goals was that it didn't matter if you were Microsoft or Adobe, you could create Acorn or you could create Pixelmator, and it could be right there on the App Store next to these billion-dollar companies. And because you're using core graphics and core animation and all these things that they invest in for the platform, your app can be every bit as good, maybe even better than these giant companies that don't care as much about that single app as you do. And that was sort of the the, cho the chewy granola hippie dream <laughs> of an app store is that you don't have to be the billion-dollar epic. You can get the Unreal Engine or Unity or just use – Apple's, uh, I, I'm blanking on the name, their 3D um, frameworks or AR kit and make an app every bit as good as Fortnite. And nobody knows that, you won't, that you're a, you know, a, a two-person shop grinding this out every weekend. You're competing for attention and for money right next to Fortnite. So yeah, for for uh, for Epic, it's it's sort of these two parallels. One is, you know, uh, Apple's point of view is, hey, we put you through college, and the minute that you graduated, you dumped us <laughs> and tried to get a hot new deal. And Epic's thing is, we we were miserable for all of these years, but we waited because we were amassing money and we were amassing power, and finally we can stand up to you. And they both believe they're absolutely right on those two point of views, and we're both looking, going, this is just this is just not how to be good people. I I think it is. It does look a little bit um, opportunistic on the part of Epic. It's like they're, they're eyeballing all the controversies, the EU, uh, they watched hey.com and they thought, this is our time to see if we can well, take a bite yeah. out of Apple. No, that's but it. Should, should they be punished for being smart about, you know, their, <laughs> their timing, yeah. you know, like, they well, were smart about it. The argument too. against like it WeChat is... said they want a store too. Right. The argument against it is you made the deal. You agreed to be on the platform according to these uh, rules. Uh, it's, you know, and now you're taking advantage of a, a moment in time when Apple's a little bit down to, to, to try to get around those rules. 
I'm not sure I agree with that. Yeah, no, I don't. Yeah, <laughs> I I don't agree with that either. I I I think that uh, this is why it's it's a little bit disappointing that Apple's defense anytime this sort of thing comes up is that we have rules for developers and we we expect everybody to extend the same rules. And when they drop uh, what sounds like a bombshell, like saying, "Oh well, we've just we're, we're giving you 10 days notice that we're either going to pull all your pull your act your your complete access to all of our developer tools if you don't shape up." That's uh, and they say, oh no, no, see, that's that's we're not doing something special. We're not singling you out. That's part of our agreement that we get that we put into place for everybody. And really, what they're actually saying is that no, 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 we we abuse all developers. We have contempt for all of you. <laughs> believe me, the smallest developer to the largest conglomerate is like us, like a bug underneath our steel boot heel. You're welcome. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. There's a kid. He's 24. Apple tried to hire him, but he decided he didn't want to do it. You may remember his Game Boy Advance for iOS, which, of course, Apple ended up killing. He was using the Enterprise Certificate to distribute it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but he, I don't know how he gets away with it. He has something called the Alt Store, altstore.io, yeah. which is a Mac OS app or Windows. There's a beta version where you download the server on your computer, install the app on your phone, and then... You, when the server's running, you can then connect to the server and download new apps. <laughs> this guy's name is Riley Testet. He turned down he's a job brilliant. at Apple. Yeah, he's clearly brilliant. I was brilliant. chatting with him this week. Oh, and you talked to I him. I love his perspective. Yeah, well, I love his perspective because, uh, like, I learn so much. Like, often I say dumb things on Twitter because I want to read what people say who are way smarter than me and then I can learn something. And he immediately said, like, there's, there's all these different opinions. Like, Ben Thompson believes that Apple should just allow alternate payment methods, that it's too risky to allow other uh, other sources of apps. And he disagrees with that, saying that, you know, you, you it isn't really free unless you have other sources of apps because of things like this, but also China saying you can't have VPN apps and maybe America saying you can't have TikTok. And that the only real guard for user access is to have these sorts of third-party stores. Granted, Epic doesn't like them because they want they want their installation and their promotion too, like because they want everything. But from his point of view, and I think a lot of developers' point of view, that by itself, just gatekeeper on iOS by itself would remove so much pressure. Maybe they'll still go on the App Store voluntarily, but there's a difference between doing it because you want to and doing it because you have to. Mm. Yeah, yeah, he this, says, Riley says, if apps Apple allowed side loading, they could keep all the same App Store rules. There'd be an alternative for developers. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's no different than Mac OS, secure. really. Yeah. 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 And, I, and I think that um, Apple runs their app stores for, from the consumer side. Apple runs the app store so well that if you did have an alternative app store, it would be something that most people would kind of be somewhat aware of but have no interest in. Uh, and they wouldn't provide the sort of apps with maybe one or two exceptions that people would really be interested in as well. I, I feel as though it would be sort of like jailbreaking, meaning that it's something that is out there. It's something that you can do. It's something that people are – some people are even aware that you can do. But it's not the sort of thing that anybody who – it's not the sort of thing that people who uh, with normal needs uh, can't, can't do without uh, – I'm sorry. Let me back up one one half of a sentence. Uh, it's all of people's needs seem to be being met best and very very well by the by the regular Apple App Store. And if there were this all these alternative app stores, they would be kind of weird. They would be on the outskirts, but they would be present for people who actually want them. He's. It's interesting. The Alt Store has been around for a year. And he gets away with it because it's a loophole that's very hard for Apple to close. <laughs> uh, it's the same reason I could put games or apps I develop on my iPhone using Xcode. Uh, and you have to allow that. Otherwise, developers couldn't test the apps yeah. on iPhone or uh, iPad. So that's what he's doing. In effect, that alt store game or app that you're adding appears to the iPhone as something you developed that you're yeah. sideloading from your own computer to the phone and i don't know how apple would stop that without uh making it hard to do you'd break probably. everything you'd break a lot yeah. of things and i guess that's why <laughs> apple's just decided it's too complicated and we're not going to have to worry about this honestly this this whole uh, fracas underscores for me what i philosophically always believed which is that uh open systems especially for platforms are the is the best solution the proprietary systems for platforms uh, inevitably comes down to problems like this. This is kind of the inevitability mm -hmm. of it. The only difficulty is that open systems, things like Linux, 
there's no open there are some open phones there's a pine phone that's based on linux but they're not really competitive and open systems have yet to develop the ease of use and the competitive hardware that uh, proprietary uh Companies Maybe it's developed. good to have both, though. I mean, like well, the argument is whether it's good to have both on. Like, do do we do we need a whole closed and a whole open system like we have now with iOS and Android, or can both systems be both closed and open, and that is provide highly curated experiences and completely open options? So, like, would people benefit from have from a gatekeeper on iOS? I think so. Would they benefit from having a better boutique on Android. Probably some people would who are who are more nervous and more worried about these sorts of things. And if you can cater to both the edge cases, you probably catch most of the people in between too. Yeah, and one, one of the big problems I think is that uh, we have to also acknowledge the fact that sometimes uh, companies can do something that is legitimately the best choice for consumers that also happens to be anti-competitive. Uh, and so we have to navigate that as we try to figure out what do we want, what what role do we want the government to uh, to to do in terms of regulating what these companies have the power to do, uh, because I mean they're, they're, we could we could spend an hour talking about examples, but the I, I you know that I am evangelical about saying that look if you can't do whatever you want with a piece of hardware you spend a thousand dollars for you don't own it. Nonetheless, the fact that it is such a tight tightly controlled environment, the fact that all of the apps that you install on an iPhone come from an app store where there are at least uh, a lot of basic rules that developers have to come come with and as Renee keeps saying the fact that the uh, tools that developers are given to create really rich and wonderful experiences without having to uh, invent an entire graphics pipeline all of those things benefit users and it's possible to acknowledge that while also acknowledging that this is giving Apple an unfair advantage and power over the market for apps on this device. I think it's hyper competitive versus anti competitive is the language that the court looks at. Like you're allowed yeah. to do, e you're allowed to do everything up until the point we don't like it. Yeah, Ben Thompson makes <laughs> that point in his uh, strategy piece. In fact, he leads it off, uh, quoting a um, a decision in the Qualcomm case from the Ninth Circuit, yeah. which will also be same hearing. lawyers, by the way. Same that, lawyers. Uh, Epic yeah. hired are the Qualcomm lawyers. Same court that uh, Epic will be in, um, and the the judge Consuelo Callahan last week wrote, the case asks us to draw the line between anti-competitive behavior, which is illegal under federal antitrust law, and hyper-competitive behavior, which is not. Ben says, this is admittedly a distinction I have not seen before, but it perhaps is a useful one for the simple reason that being a successful business by definition means being anti-competitive. Without some sort of differentiation and or superior cost structure, any sort of margin of business has will be competed away. So preserving that differentiation or cost structure, being anti-competitive in that general sense, should be the goal of any business. Uh, yeah, and a lot maybe, of people complain about Qualcomm, too, and the court said it's right, fine. Right, <laughs> right. Uh, business should compete. They just can't break the law <laughs> along the way. Yeah. Yeah. And maybe hyper-competition is a better way to describe what Apple yeah. and Qualcomm were up to. But it's a, it's a very malleable concept. Remember, that's always human beings that have to decide whether or not they're uh, engaging in anti-competitive processes or not. Yeah. And I think, and one of the one of the bets that Epic is making is that we are in an environment where, whereas five years ago this would have been a much harder case to to put forward, now that we have bipartisan support uh, in Congress for basically knocking down a peg, any company that's making a, any tech company that's making a trillion dollars, we feel as though this is a really good time to pounce at the very minimum, a good time to get a very, very favor favorable negotiated settlement with Apple. And the problem is like, if they do go to the courts or to legislation, we had the ebook trial and they were concerned about pricing. So Amazon won and now Amazon has 83% of the ebook market. They were concerned about competition in the EU. They made Microsoft put a browser ballot up. Slepnir and Opera are no better off for that browser ballot. And now instead of like six rendering engines, we have two, we have two and a fork and one of them is, is on life support. So like they're like letting it get that far does not always end up well for anybody. Yeah. Mm. Hmm. I'm a slip near. Yeah. <laughs> no. <laughs> did you ever use it? <laughs> I did. Just when I when the browser ballot came out, I downloaded and tried them. And the Norway the the Scandinavians made a bunch of very delightful browsers. That's. <laughs> oh, there you go. That's good. That's also good. rally cars. 
I don't know yeah. if there's a link there. <laughs> well, is Slept yeah. near a, a Chrome or derivative, or is it is its own? Uh, they, thing? I think they all are now. I mean, Opera uses WebKit now, and Firefox was again was on life support as of last week. Now they've got a fresh infusion of Google money, but that's not like I. I Microsoft had Spot uh, Spot uh, Spotlight, something light, and then um, and then Edge, and then now they just use Chromium. I mean, the browser. There's competition in that they have different labels on them, right? But they aren't. We no longer have four or five different vibrant rendering engines like we used to. Right. Yeah. The, the, question, the question with that is that um, what's the argument that uh, that the makers of these rendering en engines have actively tried to crush competition? I've, I think that the most that the biggest vector towards that has always been that uh, the the browser is now a development environment and uh, developers are uh, are building commercial apps in the form of you know eBay New York Times Amazon all these other apps that run inside of browsers and they don't want uh, if they if they have incompatibility problems that affects their ability to make money that affects their ability yep. to track users uh, and so that's why I think the, the the market has sort of collapsed in rendering engines they don't want to have to target five different Can engines you imagine anymore. Can you imagine if Apple goes, okay, you can have as many stores as you want, but you can only use iOS frameworks in our store. <laughs> you got to build it yourself otherwise. Yeah. Like, we'll give you the yep. compatibility, that's fine, but you got to build it all. Go for it. Yep. Then Epic can do it, but not very many Predictions. other Predictions. What's going to happen? I think that they're going to lose eventually. I think it might be surprising how late, uh, how how many appeals have to happen before Who, who's Epic loses the lawsuit. Epic. I, I think I, I think that Apple is going to lose. Ev excuse me, if Epic is going to lose eventually, I think that's going to surprise a lot of people how high up it has to go before uh, they they lose. They finally lose their suit on appeal. I honestly think that it's. I I also I think that there's a slightly lower chance that these two companies are simply going to get together and figure out a way to prevent this from becoming a three, four, five year lawsuit. Epic is definitely at a disadvantage here because I think Apple has greater power to hurt Epic than Epic has to hurt Apple. Apple Epic's biggest uh, leverage is essentially giving another howitzer <laughs> to, to Congress and regulators in their battle against uh, against uh, the idea that uh, that Apple has a monopoly on, on, their, on their market. So I, I do think that this is gonna end in a settlement eventually. You agree, Laurie? I think Epic is going to give in and do what Apple says, and then they're going to tell the world how Apple is so horrible I for agree. the things that they made them do. <laughs> I think you're exactly right. Yeah, yeah. I think and they're going to they're going to look really good with it too. They're going to look real good on that. I one. think that they thought yeah. this whole game through, and that they knew that's what would happen. Mm -hmm. That this is all part yeah. of the plan. Renee, what do you think? Just looking at their past behavior, yeah, I think looking at their past behavior, they did blink with the Google Play Store. You know, they realized that they had to be on there, but they made a huge stink about it first. And I think they'll do that here too. And also Sweeney hated Microsoft. He was raging. He was so mad at Microsoft because they wouldn't let the Unreal Engine onto HoloLens 2. And then Microsoft said, okay, fine. He's like, I love Microsoft. I heart Microsoft. And now they're like super best buddies. So he, his affection can be easily bought when he gets what he wants. So my guess is they like Epic will do exactly what Laurie said. They, you know, they'll, they'll say, oh, this is untenable. We're going to go back on the store, but we're not going to like it. And then a few weeks later, it's, it's sort of like when you negotiate for hostage release. You know, we can't give in to terrorists, but then you get really low development loans like a month later or two months later after the people are let loose. They're just going to, they'll, everyone will be fine. You'll get your Unreal Engine. And then two weeks later, two months later, Apple announces one or two changes to the App Store that happen to be not everything Epic wants, but enough that, you know, a few of the billions move from Apple to Epic. And the last thing just to add is when the, when everything is so, it, when the economy and everything is great and the money is just there for everybody, everyone concentrates on expanding the pie. But the minute anything goes bad, everyone just looks over at the other slices <laughs> thinking about how come I can't get more of that other slice of pie? So this this is common. Like if, if they were making money hand over fist faster than they can count, like Jeff Bezos level money, we probably wouldn't be seeing this. It's when things yeah. get tight and and they suddenly want to still make profits in a downward trend that they that everyone starts trying to think about how much money they could take away from each other. Yeah, I'll just I'll just say that Epic really hired a murderer's row of of, of, yes. of counsel for this lawsuit. I I think that at least from Epic's perspective, they think they have a very very real chance at winning this lawsuit because there are less there are less expensive lawyers to hire. There are less uh, these are these are the lawyers that you hire to put the fear of God into <laughs> into the defendant and and, and they're or usually on the other side. That you hire to win. 
Yeah, I mean, you have, you have a former commissioner of the FTC. You have a uh, former uh, attorney Gen assistant attorney, deputy attorney general in front of antitrust for the Obama administration. Again, Christine Varney, I, I am terrible at just remembering names just out of the blue. But as soon as I saw that, oh, they've got Christine Varney. Yeah. I, did, I did not have to Google that name. That's that's kind of so know scary. where all the bodies are buried because they usually defend against antitrust delegations. They don't usually launch them. So they probably know very well which ways to attack these particular laws. Yeah. Well, and also let's point out Apple has some money too, so I'm sure they yeah, exactly so they, they can they can and, and they and they have other revenue streams other than the 30 percent they're yeah. getting from Epic Games. Yeah. So yeah, I, I'm sure we're they, gonna, they have they have a they have a comfortable position. I think it's gonna it's gonna be uh, it's not quite the Scopes Monkey trial, but we're gonna see some very good opposing <laughs> arguments in this. I, it's I, you know whichever way you come down on it for us, it's great. It gives us a lot of stuff to talk about over the next. <laughs> four or five years. Can I just right? quickly add that I think it would be great from a PR point of view if Epic were to do a little bit of leadership by example, because they're currently being sued by a lot of, especially women and black artists who say that they have just stolen their dances and are selling them to people on yeah. the Epic, you know, the emote store inside Epic. And, you know, and Epic hates it when people get in between creators and audiences, when other people make money off of your effort and work. So I think it would be fantastic and would really help them in this if they, if they gave Carlton from the Fresh Prince of Bel Air, exactly. his money, and the backpack kid, his money, and everyone else who they've made these billions some, just give them their share, and then no one could argue with you that you're in this for altruistic reasons. Yeah, but that's not going to happen because they're not. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> you're just a hippie, Renee. Come on. <laughs> they're, they're just a younger Goliath. There's no David in this. They're just a younger Goliath. <laughs> uh, we're going to take a little break. Lots more to talk about, but uh, we'll move on from the epic story. It is an epic. I love it. It's aptly named the Apple so Epic. Much drama. Yeah. Our show today brought to you by Roman. Uh, guys often have a little bit of an issue going to the doctor. I don't know what it is about us. I think, honestly, uh, I'm going to blame Little League. I think it started uh, when we were playing team sports and the coach said, when you get hit by the ball, don't show the pain. R don't rub it. Right? Even in Major League Baseball, they still do. Don't touch it. Don't rub it. Just walk to first base like it didn't hurt at all. And you can see they're in agony. They're practically crying because it's there's no crying in baseball. Where the coach says, rub some dirt in it when you get a scuff after sliding in a home. That, that's what we grow up with. But there are some medical conditions you probably should see a doctor about. One is erectile dysfunction. Uh, it's a normal thing as we age. But younger people with it, it could be a sign of an underlying condition. In fact, that's how Roman was started. A young guy. Suffering ED. Fortunately, his father was a male health uh, doctor, physician. He he wasn't too embarrassed to tell his dad. I think most of us would be too embarrassed to tell our doctor, but fortunately he didn't because his dad said, you know, at your age, that could be something more serious. They got tests, found out it was an underlying heart condition. He had surgery. He's fine now, but he and his dad started Roman as a result. They've built a digital health clinic for guys who just, who just are too embarrassed or too macho to go to the doctor. And of course, it does, if, if, if you're suffering from ED, it does kind of, you know, it's tough to admit to that if you're macho. But let me tell you something. Your uh, loved ones know, <laughs> and there's no reason to suffer, no reason for them to suffer, no reason for you to suffer. It's, it's easily fixed. You really need to go to the doctor. It's awkward to talk about in person, but there's a simple, convenient solution to get the treatment you need without leaving the couch. It's Roman. They've spent years building a digital platform that connects you with a doctor licensed in your state without leaving the house. Nowadays, it's really a good thing, right? Uh, get discreet professional care and, and a real doctor, not some guy just going to write a prescription for you. But you do get genuine prescription medication, not some pills shipped from China or anything. We're the real deal. Or in they have over-the-counter treatments as well for other conditions in unmarked packaging. No one needs to know. Roman helps you with sexual health, hair and skin, dandruff and eczema, daily health too. They have some great supplements for guys, prostate health, bone health, uh, and they make it very convenient. You grab your phone or your computer, complete a free online visit. You're going to hear back from a U.S. licensed physician within 24 hours. And, if the, and the doctor is going to really do a checkup. And if they decide the treatment is right for you, your medication can be shipped right to your door with free two-day shipping. So 
your suffering is just is the end of your suffering is just two days away. You also get free unlimited free unlimited follow ups with your doctor anytime for questions. If you want to adjust your treatment plan, there's no commitment. You can cancel at any time. Roman is a great source for guys for wellness, and it's actually so easy. It you you're actually going to say you know I, I need to I need to use this more often. This is good. If you're struggling with ED, don't worry. It's okay. It happens. Go to GetRoman.com slash MacBreak for a free online visit and free two-day shipping. That's GetRoman.com slash MacBreak. When you go to the website, too, look at all the uh, different conditions they treat. It's really become, when we first started doing the ads, it was really just ED, but they've really broadened it. And they cover a lot of uh, things that men, you know, don't want to talk about. Like hair loss. Get Roman.com slash MacBreak for your free online visit, free two-day shipping. Uh, they're really doing important work. Licensed pharmacy, licensed U.S. licensed physicians. It's the real deal. Uh, let's see. Weibo survey asking users to choose between WeChat and iPhones. <laughs> 1.2 million responses 95% said, we'd rather give up the iPhone than give up WeChat. Now, this isn't because Apple's thinking of getting out of China or banning WeChat. <laughs> it has to do with the White House, which has already banned, well, I don't know, banned. They've, along with uh, um, restricting TikTok, WeChat was also in that executive order. They, I think they now, the new, the new time, it was 45 days. They now have 90 days to find a U.S. buyer or all their funds will be and frozen. Larry Ellison is all up in it now. Oracle wants it. <laughs> Oracle talk. Oracle Larry's wants it. I mean, enough for so much respect for making the world's worst database, but just yeah, <laughs> and then making a lot of money on it. So uh, yeah. Apple may be in that position because if if you can't, uh, it, you just you wouldn't be able to be on the iPhone, I guess. And uh, so this is the Bloomberg story. Felix Tam and Xi and Chen, Apple's $44 billion China market. I didn't realize China was that important. Threatened yeah. by this WeChat ban because the Chinese customers who use WeChat would rather switch than fight. Yeah, it, it, the, it, the Chinese market represents multiple percentage points of Apple's, uh, Apple's uh, revenue. So this is a really super big deal. Yeah. If Apple were forced... Wait, 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 wait. I'm sorry. Can we just point out that Andy put on his blazer? <laughs> oh, wait a minute. I missed that. I wasn't I looking. To. Let's see. Well, I mean, no, if, if, if you're gonna if, if you're gonna bring like the it tattoo, does, it I, does match is, her tat. That's very this scary. Isn't, this isn't this isn't as cool as your tattoo, but at least I'm upping my game. It's it also has the uh, symbols symbols on the elbow patches, and, che and che uh, you know, check out this lining. Is he going to show us what's on the button? Okay, oh. He's got uh, yeah, Darth the, Vader the helmet lining. Yeah, or, it's got the, no, oh, that's Boba, Boba Fett, Fett, of course. Mandalorian. Yeah. 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 It's we a hot meeting at an exclusive the, club. They have their own logo. Oh, and look the at that. And, uh, wow. Great. It's an interesting choice with the double set pockets. Uh, I don't know exactly you know, what's going on. If you and Andy there. are going to coordinate in the morning, the least you could do is drop one that is quite we a had look. our full, we had our four Beskar steel armors ready. We could have been wearing them right now and just be feel like idiots. Wow. Okay, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. I just, sorry, it, sorry. I was so, it was so beautiful. One, <laughs> how, many, one, how many years have we been working together? I now learned that Andy has a blazer with the same patch on it that Lori's <laughs> shoulder tattoo has. The whole cast is coming together. They're both Mandalorians. What about you, Renee? What have you got to prove your allegiance? I, I crawled out of a Sarlacc pit this morning, Leo. There's not much more I can give the show. Now. Well, excuse me, let, let's, can, can, we, can we highlight his wonderful Mo uh, Mo Montreal Expos cap? Oh, that's good. Yeah. The the the, L, the the classic L logo, that's one of my a, favorite a, uh, baseball logos of all time. It's also nice and gray, which I really like. I like the monochromatic. <laughs> I have baseball the child caps. on the shelf behind me, just a little. He's, he's talking to Groot on the shelf behind all me. Right. Oh, you count. On. There you we go. count. Okay. There we go. There's right. Baby Yoda with Groot. Baby, Baby Yoda's Groot. on there with Baby Groot. That's a good combination. Yeah. Plus, you use lightsabers for your for your in studio lighting, so that's that's yes. not nothing. <laughs> if <laughs> Apple were forced and, and, to remove WeChat from the App Store. Uh, analysts say annual shipments of the iPhone would decline 25 to 30 percent. 
That's all. I mean, WeChat is the software layer, is is the operating system layer yeah. effectively for most of China. Yeah. Ninety five percent of participants say they'd rather switch devices than give up WeChat. I, I, I hear Windows this all the time from people who use WeChat. A lot of them uh, have family in China. It's the only yeah. way they talk to them. They they say you don't understand. WeChat's not just like Facebook Messenger. It's no. the ecosystem. It's everything. Yep. It's a, it's, it's a platform. You, 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 pay, you, pay for, you pay for things with WeChat. You travel with WeChat. You do your banking with WeChat. You do, it's, it is, every time I see uh, YouTube videos of people living in China, the only time I ever see, the only, the only transaction platform for any sort of transaction between two human beings in China is through WeChat. So I, I'm, I'm with Renee. It's, it's amazing that there's anybody who said that they'd be willing to give up, I mean, they'd be willing to give up uh, uh, WeChat in order to keep their iPhones. And that's kind of remarkable. And listen to this. Uh, they interviewed a Shanghai-based commodities trader who was thinking about replacing his Huawei handset with an iPhone, which he stopped now. He said, I'm worried that WeChat will be banned on the iPhone. That would affect my work to a large extent. 90% of my clients and colleagues communicate via WeChat. But he's also worried about switching to, he's thinking about Samsung, but then he realizes... Because it's Android, he's worried that this ban will also affect Android, and that he won't be able to run WeChat on a and an Android device. That he it's going to be good for the Chinese handset makers like Huawei, which has yeah. you know doesn't is a no they 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 should be okay because remember that Google doesn't have an app store in China uh, right so they 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 all all the handsets that use Android are using the open version of Android ah, so okay. people but people will still continue to use Android phones they just won't. <laughs> Be able to they they will just continue to not have any sort of uh, any money going to Google for that, yeah. um, and that it's and but that does uh, there is a there is is it a, a, an area of concern that there's so much of what we used to think as an open and free internet is now becoming really compartmentalized and contained by government and and by uh, by all the conflicts that we're having already there are classes of Huawei phones that you can't really that you can't get anywhere else uh, anywhere else except for China because or you can't get in the United States because of the ban against uh, importing and doing business with with Huawei products there are a whole bunch of other platforms that you can't get uh, in the United States chiefly because of trade bans and uh, and the ability to have a powerful market that sort of lives in and of itself it's it's kind of disappointing and it also makes me wonder how worried apple is that they're going to continue to be able to do business in china whether they're whether they want to whether they think that it's a uh, uh, separate from whatever discussions they're having about uh their responsibilities as a corporate world entity will they even be able to continue to operate in china in a way that makes sense for apple anymore it's not just apple in fact according to the wall street journal uh several big american companies uh, got on a call with the white house before this yeah. ban begging them not to ban wechat apple ford walmart walt disney and others trying to persuade the president not to do this because it would hurt their business. Procter & Gamble, Intel, MetLife, Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley, UPS, Merck, Cargill. These are This is the blue chip American companies. Uh, and obviously they couldn't persuade uh, Trump to, uh, to back down. None of them own golf courses. Sadly, if they'd yeah. owned golf courses, we would just be fine now. That's humor, folks. It's he, humor. He didn't. He didn't. He, well, he didn't back down on Huawei either. The stakes were a lot bigger with Huawei, yeah. but uh, at this point, I think he has more support for Huawei because it's again, it, yeah. you know he's got the he's got the Commerce Department uh, even in the Obama administration concerned Department of Defense because Huawei is a network infrastructure company. I right, think that's and, the and big other, concern there. And other world governments are also involved yeah. in that. Where we just we don't want Huawei to be building out. This our is unilateral. Now. This TikTok yeah. WeChat thing is completely unilateral. That's completely coming out of the White House. Yeah, and to be fair, I know that I think last week I was talking about how there seems to be a lack of evidence so far that TikTok is doing anything unusual in terms of surveillance. Since then, there has been uh, there there has been a report about it. Uh, 
taking part in practices, at least on the Android platform, that violate uh, Android's own privacy and security uh, regulations. It remains to be seen whether, kind of like what we talked about last week, is this because they are acting as an espionage tool for a foreign government, or is this because they are a social media network that wants to grab as much data as they possibly can just on principle? Augustus Gloop falling into the chocolate river. This is any any <laughs> any social media app that you put onto the onto a phone. Apple One uh, is we had uh, speculated for some time that Apple might offer a, a bundle of some kind. Mark Gurman says it is going to be called Apple One. This is not confirmed by Apple yet, but he has sources inside Cupertino. That will let customers subscribe to several services at a lower monthly price, but not much lower. If it's so Germans bizarre, like the service right. doesn't match the tin. Like the, yeah. sorry, the label doesn't match the tin. It's called Apple One, but it's still like eight hundred different things. It's Apple Music, Apple TV Plus. Uh, that's the basic package. Uh, the higher end package will have that plus arcade. Next tier up. Adds new as uh, Apple Music TV Plus Arcade now News Plus, and then there's finally a, a a big bundle, the real Apple One bundle, which includes iCloud storage. Not clear how much iCloud storage and all of that, but German estimates that it's a savings of maybe five dollars to that's buy it through one. the bundle. Like, that's not, not a gully dwarf, but I can count high enough to know that's not one. That's like one. eight. Yeah. <laughs> Well, well, one means one, one buy. One. Yeah, yeah. It's, yeah. It's Apple Prime. It's the same thing as Amazon uh, Prime is. We'd heard about this for a long time. You speculated about it, uh, I think, Renee, when, uh, when yeah. you know. But this isn't Prime. Apple Prime TV is Plus one price. That's the, whole, that's the whole point of using a name like they Prime or tiers One. They don't have with Otherwise, Prime. you call it Apple Your Way or right. Apple, you know, right. the more you Actually, add, the more you Apple say. Amazon Prime does have tiers. So they have the Amazon Prime where it's just um the the digital watching of things and then they have the amazon prime tier that includes the shipping thing so they do have tiers there's just oh you, you can know. just get to tv it's, alone instead of just because i think most people think prime is i didn't know you that. get you I'm get two-day right shipping and then by the way there's a bunch of other and stuff we'll throw get, in <laughs> I, I believe there is a tier that allows oh, you to okay. just have okay. the digital downloads and it okay. doesn't include the shipping i believe yeah. that's that's the case yeah uh, or it might be the opposite, which is shipping but no digital. There is one new service, I, a, I'm fairly a, a virtual fitness service codenamed Seymour. Uh, yeah, Matt Rumors had that in March. Yeah, that's that's been around for a while, but that would also be part of the bundle. Virtual classes, uh, I you know I, that that's a valuable package. I guess the new bundles will be geared towards families, so they'll work with family sharing. Uh, they're, according to German, the offerings are designed to save consumers about $2 to <laughs> as much as $5 a month, depending on how much you buy. That's my big problem with it. It doesn't seem like you no. get much of an advantage. You get stuff you don't really care about, and then uh, you don't get much of an advantage. Is that a cable TV joke, Leo? Is that like get ESPN along with 13 different gardening channels per herb? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but, no, but it does I, make I sense. There, there, there are a lot of things that Apple Apple offers that I probably wouldn't pay for as a standalone service. But if you gave it to me as a bundle, I probably would see the logic in that without taking the time to do the math. But also, hey, five bucks is five bucks. That's yeah. that's not a whole burrito, but that's like most of a burrito. <laughs> that could be the same. Andy, I agree slogan. with you. I think I think that we all. We we kind of fall for the trick, if you will, of marketing yeah. things when it's on sale. You know, you know, like Prime Day is a perfect example. I never wanted this, you know, just light for my toilet seat, but suddenly now that it's fifty percent <laughs> off, I have to have it. You know, it's it's the same kind of idea, and I I agree. I would I know I would do the same thing if there was a bundle of it. I'm only saving two to five dollars. I'm getting some service that I actually probably am not that interested. I would do it anyway because I would think, well, this is a good deal for the entire package. So, well, I think we I think would all do it because we buy all that. that crap. I mean, we're already, I already, there's, I own every we're one. We're getting of them, the so. discount. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so it gives us five bucks. Yeah. Uh, the approach, according to German, is likely to be applauded by Wall Street. And that's really what's happened with Apple is they're doing <laughs> revenue per yep. customer as opposed to revenue uh, by selling devices. 
and Wall Street likes that. Uh, I would love it if they took their prime thing of value because like Amazon – and I, th I think Neelay from The Verge was talking about this. Amazon's value is that delivery and they're just making it more and more attractive for you to hook into that delivery, like the, the buy, ship, whatever thing by adding on services on top of it. Where Apple's prime, prime motivator, forgive the pun, is the iPhone and they already have subscriptions based on the iPhone. You can pay monthly, get a new iPhone every year and building value on top of that where for a couple extra bucks on your iPhone payment, you get all of these services as well. And that really becomes transformative because it's your best customers already paying you on schedule and you're just increasing the amount of their payments. It's limited because that plan is mostly US only or carrier based in other parts of the world. But if Apple could build that out where you get, right now they have two tiers, just the phone and the phone and Apple Care Plus. Um, but if they had more tiers where you had like, T I would just give TV to anybody right now. They're not even producing new shows. They can't. So <laughs> yeah. like, like just music and TV and then like a couple extra bucks. Is all right. Make it like when you're configuring a new Mac where it's like, oh, it's only a hundred bucks extra for this. Oh, it's only a hundred bucks. <laughs> Pretty soon it's a thousand bucks, but you didn't notice. And if they could do that, that would be an Apple one for me. The, uh, maybe now how much would you pay? Apple Music's added two, exactly. new, two new stations, right? Apple Music Hits and Apple Music Country. Um, no hip hop lame. No hip hop. Two you channels know. I don't care about. Didn't Yay. we always? Didn't we always think that the the, the Apple Radio Play was going to have multiple channels, and then it was only Beats yeah. One for the longest time. That by the, the way, name one implied more than one, right? <laughs> yeah, that would be Channel One, and then there's no Channel Two. It will be renamed yeah. Apple Music One. Apple Music Hits will celebrate everyone's favorite songs. Maybe not mine from the '80s, '90s, and 2000s. Apple Music Country will spotlight country music. The one thing that Apple's doing with these, which I think is, I don't know how I feel about it, is it's very heavily, just like Apple One, Apple Beats One, very heavily uh, DJ flavored. You know, they've got uh, big name DJs who are going to host these. Music uh, Beats One was Zane Lowe and remember and Judy Antonuga yeah. and all of that stuff. Um, and then they would have... Uh, uh, musicians host their own kind of shows. So let's see what Apple Music Hits is going to be helmed by, and maybe you know these names, Jade Donovan, Estelle, Low Key, Jen Marino, Sabi, Nicole Sky, Natalie Sky, and Strombo. I do know Strombo, and I'm sure you do yeah. too, Renee. George Strombolopoulos. Yeah. Um, Canadian icon. Can, and a Canadian icon. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, special shows. From I was going to say he's our Alan Thick, but that doesn't work. Yeah, because <laughs> Alan Thick is also your Alan Thick. Yeah. yeah. Hi. Strombo <laughs> was there, was there a scandal around Strombo? I feel like I remember that, but maybe I just not. figure there's a scandal around everybody. If yeah, you're on the internet for three minutes, yeah, yeah, you've got yeah, a scandal. Yeah, yeah. yeah, but I like Strombo. Yeah. In fact, uh, uh, Amber MacArthur was friends. Uh, really liked him, and uh, yeah, yeah, I think he's good. Uh, mm. Special shows from MSNBC host Ari Melber. Mm -hmm. Fans can also tune in to hear new exclusive shows from artists like Backstreet Boys, Ciara, Mark Hoppus, Huey Lewis, Alanis Morissette, Snoop Dogg, Megan Trainer, Shania Twain, and more. Now, Apple Music Country is going to have hosts Kelly Bannon, Ty Bennell, Bree, Alicia Davis. I have to figure these are all radio people, right, that various markets you would know them. Ward Shania Gunther. Twain's Canadian icon as well. No, I know the music. I know the music, yes. Um, so if you have Apple Music, two new stations, I'd like to see more than just two new. Is it hard yeah. to do these? Is that why they have to really work hard to develop? Well, this them? is the, the first new ones in four years, so I think we're right on schedule. Yeah, I don't understand yeah. it. I just don't. Um, I just, I've never, I still have a subscription to Apple Music and I keep dipping into it, just keep familiar with it. And I still haven't found like a DJ station that, to me has any significance apart from the automated stations that you get on any other subscription music service. I still, I, uh, there's, it would, would, it would be a great signature if Apple music were able to do something like WBCN in Boston, where it's like, this is a signature station. They're going through its personalities. They're going to control the content in a way that isn't just, Hey, we, here are the, here is the library of, of 1000, uh, 1000 tracks that you are allowed to program for your station. And we need you to program these 60 during this week. 
uh, it's it's yeah. I, I wish that it had been more of a signature for this for the, the service. I feel I'm, like I'm Apple could position. have done could have been more Apple-y. It's just instead, it's just some sort yeah, of international have, radio they, station. Yeah, I, I, they, what they really what they really could have done is said really just thrown it wide open and allowed it to become a platform kind of similar to uh, like what YouTube and Twitch are like. Where here is wouldn't a, that here be is interesting? A, here's yeah. a here's a library of music that you have access to. Here are a million tracks, and we you will. Do the, you, 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 you have to go. You have to go through a certain procedure to make sure right. that we know that you're not going to just be spouting like antifa, <laughs> or excuse me, uh, you're not going to be uh, start spouting like a uh, 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 nonsense that uh, that we're not going to approve of. Sorry, I didn't. I didn't mean to say antifa. I was I was looking for there. There are three other organizations that that come up in my mind, and I couldn't think of it. And then they're they're such idiots that I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I, it would it would be to give it a, to give it a, a sense of like spontaneity and a sense of identity and a sense of a sense sense of we are here to support every voice that's out there, people who, who are I providing think that's too much music that isn't up Too there. much moderation would be required yeah, for that. Yeah, yeah, but that, that I, mean, I that, just don't that understand. It's kind of retro because uh, I, 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 think, I guess this, this, I believe this goes back to Jimmy Iovine, who right from yeah. when he started uh, at Apple, when the Beats sale happened, said that what people miss is curation. And that's the only answer you can have if you're in, you know, in the radio business, because Honestly, you got every song. You know, there's all sorts of algorithmic ways you can put a playlist together for people, but they already do that. What's the one thing missing? Well, a human curated. But I think that that's very old fashioned. I don't know if people want that anymore. I mean, yeah, I don't. I don't. I don't. I I listen to Beats One a little bit, and then I realize I'm just annoyed by these people. Just get it. Let me listen to my music. I don't want to hear it. Twenty four seven worldwide. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, it might. It, yeah, the, the fact that I'm coming up with WBCN as a reference point that might just show up how how old I am. They the they, they went out of business several years ago when. Well, the there you go. All freeform by, radio did, Andy. Yeah. I hate to tell you, <laughs> but, but wasn't it? But but wouldn't it be great to, to be able to? I still think that there's something about that that's still very very valid. The the idea that it's, it, it wasn't a Coke versus Pepsi sort of thing. It's that you know it's five it's five minutes after five o'clock. I'm definitely turning tuning into to BCN to, to hear the comedy I'm definitely tuning into Carter Allen I'm definitely uh, I'm, I'm home for, uh, it's a, it's a weekend I'm definitely uh, tuning into Charles Lockwood era because you you really really had a sense of identity with this station it was it was playing lots of music you liked and introducing you to things that you had no idea but you kind of had an idea that you would trust them uh, to give you stuff that's interesting and introduce you into new into new directions i just wish that there was something uh, maybe there is something like that that i haven't come across but it seems like an opportunity for some streaming uh, streaming service I, I, this is all coming out because this is a uh, i i have to dump google play music i have to dump youtube music because it's terrible and google play music is as being shut down whether youtube music is capable of, of taking up uh, that role or not and so now i'm like okay do i switch i, I am subscribing to apple uh, apple music but should i now take up a paid subscription to spotify to basically give me the access to a million tracks when I'm doing sampling and when I'm just uh, trying to figure out something new. And I'm just shocked that th all three of these services, with the exception of YouTube Music being you know, s stinky, they're basically the same sort of thing where you launch the app and it will show you lots of playlists and lots of new music and lots of stuff that you're not interested in and you have to do a couple of tabs before you get into, here is my personally curated area of this experience. And it's just, uh, I just feel like you can, you can go for any of these three and still get pretty much 80 to 90% the same experience. And that kind of frustrates me. We're going to take a little break here. Uh, come back. There's lots more to talk about on Mac Break Weekly. Um, let me see. I wanted to do, I thought there were three new things from Apple. Oh, there is another one. Apple Care. Uh, used to be you had to buy it quickly. Right? How long you had? Sixty days after you bought yeah. an Apple product, they'd even they even put up little uh, little reminders. You only have a few a few weeks left to buy that <laughs> Apple Care. Apple Care. You want Apple Care? Come on. Okay. Now you have a year in the U.S. and Canada to get Apple Care Plus, um, which kind of makes sense because what you're doing is extending the existing year long warranty. Right? So you should have until the warranty runs out to extend it. It makes sense to me. Is that why they're doing it? I don't know. 
<laughs> it's a, I think pr- it probably just gives people a better chance of opting into the service and just once again increases service rev- services revenue. Yeah. Yeah. And we should point out one of the reasons Apple is fighting so bitterly over the App Store, this is a graph from uh, Bloomberg, is that mo- when you talk about services revenue, the App Store is easily the lion's share. Number two is the Google search deal. This is estimate, according to uh, analysts at Bernstein. Uh, then Apple Care. Everything else is far below it. So you really do want to beef up Apple Care if you can. You want to beef up the App Store if you can. I'm sure they'd like to see these other services pick up, but uh, they're yeah. they're not as big, they're not as important. At least Apple doesn't break this down. This is at least according to what an analyst says. I don't know how I. I think Neil Seibart says he disputes all that. But yeah, yeah see, that's the problem. How do you see yet. what what metric? How would you how would you figure that out? I don't know how you would figure that out. It's all a guess. Slide rule. I'm guessing there's a slide rule yeah. involved. Maybe an Apple. <laughs> yeah. And Apple has expanded its independent repair shop uh, program. Yeah. To Mac computers, so this is this is actually really good news in the right to repair scene. Um, the, the program was expanded last year to iPhones. Mac users either had to go in an Apple a store or an authorized warranty service provider to get fixes with parts from Apple. Now you can go to an independent third party. This is important. Uh, in fact, it's timely because I uh, on the weekend before Apple's announcement, uh, I had a woman call who had. Her husband, whose name was Cy, she said, don't say my husband's name on the air. His name was Cy he, from Encino, in case you know him. Uh, he, reached, he reached over and knocked over the iMac and it broke oh, and it broke oh, the no. glass. And uh, I said, you know, actually, uh, Apple might charge you more than if you could find an independent repair store. But if they don't have the parts, there's nothing you could do about that. Then I found out it wasn't just the glass. The LCD, the screen also got damaged. And mm. now, it's a, now it's a very yeah. expensive repair. So, yeah. uh, but it would I'm, be I'm glad not, I remember springing in my MacBook to uh, when we had Mac Adam here in San Francisco. My, my friend uh, Tom Santos' uh, independent app st- repair store. I had brought my, my MacBook stopped charging. I kind of jammed the, this is years ago, jammed the cable. And Apple said, yeah, you need a new logic board. I brought it to Tom and he said, oh, yeah, we just solder that back on and it'll cost you $25. And that was a big difference. And I think this having these independent guys who maybe are willing to do a little bit more is good. Yeah. TechServe, all these, there are a lot of these regional stores that just create their own legends. Like TechServe was legendary yeah. in, in New York yeah. City, and I can't tell you how de- how depressing it was to walk by there, like back in uh, January or February. And now it was like, the, at least for for the day, it was this boutique sort of thing selling like really exclusive prints and posters. And it was like, oh, you used to be just like full of riffraff like me with like <laughs> trying trying to trying to hope that they that the repair person doesn't smell the Dr Pepper on the on the key board so you can say oh it just stopped working uh, but I'm, I'm glad that apple is really moving forward on this because this was another thing that was giving them a lot of bad pr that they really deserved uh, as people were con- were going to uh, genius bars and coming back saying well i came to them with a problem that my the the, the e key and the y key on my keyboard wasn't working and they tried to charge me 900 dollars to replace the entire lower half of my macbook and no they're not a lot and i went to this other place and they said they can't get the part from apple because they don't apple doesn't consider them a legitimate uh, repair shop this is something that apple really needed to take care of and i'm glad to see that without being sued <laughs> by by a murderer's row of lawyers that they're actually trying to correct that a little bit. I wonder, and that's this is an example of how putting pressure on Apple can have a beneficial result because Apple was really fighting the right to repair movement. Um, yeah. and, the, and the complaint of these independents was Apple won't give us manuals, instructions, or even sell us parts. So now they're going to do all of that. They're going to sell it's parts, sort of provide I- training to independent st- shops. Go ahead. I immediately go and look at what Lewis Rossman's hottest of hot takes is on all these things. Yes. And he was sort of he, he's sort of mixed. I, I think he's mixed to negative on it still. But uh, it's the same thing with Epic and, and Apple is that everybody is really stuck in their point of view. And Apple's 
point of view on this has always been, you know, we're really afraid. Anything goes wrong, we're going to be the ones that are sued and we can't trust anybody. And we don't know what you're going to do with the parts and we don't know that you're going to. And so they make everything just rigidly controlled. Like you can only get the screen when the customer comes and asks for it. And the prayer shop's like, that's not tenable. We need to have them in stock so that we can easily do it. And Apple's like, but then you're going to resell them. Or are you going to do this with it? And uh, so it's, it's. I, I so what does Rossman say? Because Rossman is this independent repair guy writ large. He doesn't he like YouTube it because channel. he. He 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 like he he originally praised it, saying it was a step in the right direction, or at least Apple was doing something. But he doesn't like the restrictions on it. Like for example, you have to take down all the information about the customer, their serial number, all of that. Send it to Apple. At that point, Apple will send you the part. And there's only a few parts that they currently cover under the program, and it restricts a bunch of other things that you can't do if you want to be yeah. a part of this program. So it's, I think I would say he's mixed to negative, decided probably more negative now that he's spent more time with it. But I do think, again, this is like Apple learning how to do this and they're going to get a lot of stuff wrong for the independent like boots on the ground store before they get it right. But I think it's better than what they were doing. And the only way they're actually going to get to a point where everybody trusts each other and thinks everyone has good intentions here and starts doing what's best for the customer. It is what's best for customer. the customer. I mean, if you're out of yeah. warranty, uh, it, having independent repair stores is a huge thing. You need that. And yeah. But I, and I'll 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 credit Renee on this because he's the he's the one who like, brought this concept from a background idea to a foreground idea. That now that devices have to be are, are now being built as more of one single component, and that the security of that entire device is it has to be uh, uh, has to be held integral to each component in the device it's hard for it's hard for a company to now be able to say that yes you can replace this motherboard but now we need to be able to, we net we need to disable certain security features because we can no longer trust that because components are now inside this device that we didn't put in there we can no longer trust that there isn't a piece of nefarious hardware in there that's trying to overcome some of our hardware security features in there so it's a I, you have to acknowledge that again as I, I am the I am the the, the the communist person who's saying you know I have the workers control the means of computing I am the person who owns this computer but nonetheless I have to have to do so while also acknowledging that this is a much more difficult thing and it's going to become much more difficult as Apple becomes more and more successful in getting that parts getting the parts count down uh, and integrating uh, all of their designs into simpler simpler designs that now can't really be taken apart at all Apple has uh, last week released updates to Mac OS and iOS 13.6.1 and 10.15.6. Those were bug fixes, right, Renee? Were they? I don't know. Yeah. Um, Security fixes. As and now far as I can recall, yeah. Yeah. I know. It feels like I it's know. been a month already later. I know. It was only last week. <laughs> uh, I and, applied them. Yeah, well, of course. I mean, I'm unfortunately. No new features, in other words. No new features. That's why you didn't yeah. notice it. It was so. I think it was on behalf, bug fixes. On behalf of all listeners and a good percentage of the Mac community, thank you for always being that first penguin off the ice to jump off the ice floor, Renee. <laughs> because even even I like I'm like, oh, here's a new here's a new version of the beta. I think I will wait a day and a half to install it because I don't have the emotional bandwidth right now to deal with. Any Just new out of curiosity, they call it a supplemental update on Catalina. What is that? Yeah. It means it's not like a point up. Like it's not like a like a, a big feature release. Like you get like ten point. I forget. Or I was around eleven, but this is still twelve point thirteen, fourteen, whatever. Point one, point two. It's not one of those things. It's like oh, we've got to fix this stuff. And so it's we're not going to even update cycles. the the version number. We're just gonna. The thing that's hard though yeah, is that it's, like it it's used sort of to like be when... oh this beta. Go ahead, uh, Lori. Oh, I was just gonna make a joke about how it's sort of like when the captain is releasing a supplemental update to a journal entry it's not actually <laughs> oh, major it's just log. kind of supplemental. a little supplemental captain's log yeah, yeah. Supplemental. <laughs> supplemental okay i got it it yeah. turns out uh, that so <laughs> retiring into a briefing room and talking about a problem was not the right approach because we have had our asses handed to us so there's a long-standing the tradition thing i was going to add though is um like they, sometimes there are big bugs that affect everybody. Like you download this beta and you instantly say this beta fries like the LTE radio or it does this thing and it's, it happens to everybody and that's bad. But all these devices are so complicated and everyone has such unique setups and such unique software combinations and setting toggles that, you know, 
is that it's affecting one percent or two percent of people. It's still hundreds of thousands of people. So like I, I was having a problem with PDK on the Mac, just always using tons and tons of resources, the plugin manager, and I had to kill it every day. But like I didn't find almost anyone else complaining about it. And this fixed that for me. Uh-huh. So if you had that problem, yay. But like you probably had some other problem. And like so me me installing it and saying that may mean nothing to you. Lori, it's just like, Lori, how you now that you have now. the new 2020 iMac, I know you and Renee both. You'll be glad to know that the supplemental update fixed a problem that could cause the iMac to appear washed out after waking up from sleep. <laughs> Did it fix the desire to touch the nano coating? Did it fix Lori? <laughs> Lori, don't touch it. Nope, it didn't fix that. <laughs> Did you touch it? You touched it. Oh yeah. Yeah. See the th- the thing that the thing that worries me about the nano coating is not touching it. It's that like as as you've been seeing through this like usually like if I'm spending 12 hours in front of in front of my desk, I am probably having a beverage or I might be having a snack and sometimes I'm talking and I'm spitting as I go and is there going mm-hmm. to be like a little little fleck of my my, my sandwich that is going to remind me that uh, 3 years later that oh yeah, that's right. I was having that Skype call uh, Skype call with a friend of mine and we were having nachos and yeah. Uh, now I can't get so, that. So, Laurie, off. when you touched oh. it, what did it feel like? So it <laughs> it's so funny that we're even having to talk about this, but because <laughs> they talk about this. Well, by, by the way, I should explain yeah. for those just tuning in, we're talking about the nano coating, the the matte coating on the new iMac. Because that's a pretty loaded question, yeah, so, actually. <laughs> when yeah. <I> come to <laughs> think of it. <laughs> Laurie, when you no, touched it, what did it feel like? <laughs> well, <laughs> Since the nano texture screen, it's etched glass instead of diff- a, a coating that's diffusing light. You know, you hear that description and when they show you like the super zoomed in thing and you see all these little divots in it, you're like, you oh, think well, that's going to be interesting. Yeah, it's going to feel textured. Yeah, it, it, yeah it, it feels like a matte screen. It feels, <laughs> that's it. So you do feel a texture. It doesn't feel shiny. It definitely feels a texture compared to a, an iMac that that does not have a Mac. I a think Mac does not have a nano texture. Lori Gill, yeah. you should make a YouTube video comparing. <laughs> you should have them side by side. You've got them both. Uh-huh. Touch one, yeah. touch the other. You could do a whole thing. Be a great. I can you do, do like, like music on them. See if you could scratch. My fingernail. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Reaction video. It was. Yeah. It was yeah. Just really bad. I, I, one of my least favorite parts of modern journal, uh, I can't even call it journalism, but like, so when Apple <laughs> explains this, it's like the difference between a tra- like a traditional matte display has a coating on it and what it does is diffuse light, but it, it prevent it reduces a lot of the contrast as well. What nano texture does is disrupt the light because it doesn't have a, a clean surface to ref- refract off. And it does cause some loss of, of, um, of contrast, but not as much. And immediately these videos and these articles pop up saying there's less contrast than on a non nano catcher dis- the texture <laughs> display. And you're like, yes, yes. There has that to be. Good behavior. That has to, yeah. Just not because as you're much. Because dis- you're diffusing the light. Yeah. So, I mean, please stop. Speaking yeah. of updates, well, uh, you can also get uh, developer betas. Uh, I think we must be getting close. We're now in the fifth round of developer updates for iOS 14, iPad OS 14, yeah. TV OS 14, and watch OS. But does close mean September seven. or are we waiting for the iPhone in October? Like, do we That's get a it, question. You know, I, we usually it do, feels like it could be September, more? right? You told me once, Renee, that the fifth update is usually the last. It's a, so I would prefer it, like Lori and I were talking about this earlier, and, and, and you know, the more they spread out the stuff that we have to review, the better it is for us. But, you know, they, they might feel like they can't release this until they release – they can't release the final version until they release the new phone because people from websites will go in and find out all these secrets about the new phone if they oh, do. Oh, it's knock that off. So maybe the new phone gets – maybe the new phone gets 14.1 and not 14.0. So it's like it, it just – Or it's so chaotic. Or maybe – or, or or maybe they have an extra month to work on it, and there is no need for fourteen point oh one anymore because there's there's always been that hold maybe hold back for a couple of weeks just to see if there's something that's incompatible. Uh, but who knows? Or, or I, I would be just frank, frankly knowing how hard an all hands on deck uh, developer uh, crushes at Apple, I would be just as pleased if they retained their original deadlines and simply said, okay, for three weeks it's casual Fridays. Come in if you want. Don't come in if you don't want. <laughs> Because it, it, it's hard to know wh- what they have to do with another month uh, in the uh, in the development timeline. Get the emoji ready. That's what we're all waiting for. It's that it's that the point one <laughs> update, the emoji update. That's when everybody upgrades. It's the most important update of the year. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm on the uh, I'm on the public beta, so I won't see an update till next week or the week after. Is that usually what it is? About a week later. 
Yeah, usually every year. Yeah, something like that. So it's not a week later. I think now I think they just wait longer to release the public beta, and then it's like two. If nothing goes wrong on the developers they experiment on, right. the public gets it three <laughs> days late, two days later. <laughs> I uh, This has not happened to me, but Gizmodo article by uh, Andrew Leshevsky. Hey, Apple Watch, please don't send me heart-stopping notifications that I wasn't exposed <laughs> to COVID. <laughs> have you been getting this? I haven't. <laughs> no, oh, well, I this have is Canadian. I think it all depends on, yeah. yeah. I have the Canadian I think it depends app. on where you live. Yeah. This is, uh, uh, this is the Canadian government's voluntary COVID alert mobile app for iOS and Android. So... You're not in Ontario. You're in Quebec. You have it. No, but it's the same app. Yeah, it's you're the same app. And it says no exposure. But you don't get an alert. But well, Apple doesn't control the push notifications. Apple, can, the developer, gets to set yeah. the push notifications. So um, that's interesting. Is that based on the Apple Google API? Yep. Oh, so they did do it. Yeah. See, oh, see, I have all these options that maybe I can set before I write articles about it. Get a one-time key. How it works. How it protects your privacy. Change. When did when did you get this? Uh, so I got it late only because it didn't work on the beta at first. The first few oh, betas okay. didn't have the COVID right. APIs active, and then Apple right. and activated them two weeks ago. But I think the app's been out for a month already. Nice. Uh, Apple TV Plus adding a new bundle, fifty percent off if you get the CBS All Access. And Showtime bundle, uh, that's good if you're already buying it. Uh, it will go from nine ninety nine a month each to uh, just nine ninety nine total. Actually, it's ten ninety nine for Showtime, nine ninety nine for uh, CBS All Access. No, no cheers, yeah. no, th no thrills. No, no. I'm just the Apple One bundle. I'm so confused. It's a different bundle. It's another bundle. <laughs> yeah. And Apple TV is. <laughs> I'm on board with this one because there's a lot of CBS All Access shows that I've been wanting to watch, but I didn't want to pull the trigger on it because it's another subscription, you know. And so here's a bundle and my brain goes, oh, look at this deal. So I will probably, I haven't yet, but I'll probably get this bundle. That's where Picard is, right? The CBS All Access. I got. And mm -hmm, Discover. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I got mm -hmm. it and then watched all the. We don't get the Star Trek in it because they separately license CBS Ugh. separately licensed Star Trek to Bell in Canada. So Ugh. our CBS All Access does not include Star Trek. We have to get crave for that. But I just watched all the NCISs and NCS anything with initials. I spent most of the summer watching. <laughs> <laughs> Apple TV Plus announcing a new show, a reality music competition, hosted by Reese Witherspoon, called My Kind of Country. That will focus on finding extraordinary country music talent. This is Apple's first music competition show. Of course, they're very popular on uh, regular network television. Hello Sunshine, which is, I guess, her production company, partnering with Apple TV to do this. I didn't realize she was uh, all in on the country. Apple's really, uh, really embracing the country music fans. Mm -hmm. Apple. Probably they have disposable income. Uh, let's see. Apple. This is a really weird story, but I kind of like it. Reportedly made a secret iPod for the U.S. government <laughs> yes. that had a built-in Geiger counter. And this maybe <laughs> this this comes from a former Apple uh, software engineer, David Shayer. It actually comes from Tidbits, so I should really yeah uh, show the Tidbits. The case of the top secret iPod. It was a gray day in late 2005. It makes you want to know, like, if anything you see out on the street is real. Like, maybe they're walking on the fake umbrellas and fake briefcases and fake iPods. And what? what's even real? Without knocking, the director of iPod software, my boss's boss, abruptly entered and closed the door behind him. He cut to the chase. I have a special assignment for you. Your boss doesn't know about it. You'll help two engineers from the U.S. Department of Energy build a special iPod, Rick. Report only to me. The next, I don't think he talked like that, but I, the next day the receptionist called me to tell me the two men were waiting in the lobby. I went downstairs to meet Paul and Matthew. They were engineers who would actually build this custom iPod. They were from the DOE. Uh, they didn't actually work for the DOE. They worked for Bechtel, but Bechtel was a big defense contractor of the DOE. And they wanted to put, they wanted the iPod to look completely normal, but have a Geiger counter in it. No, they're speculating it was a Geiger, Geiger counter. They're just, they, oh, the they person didn't say who, what the it person, is. 
no, the the person the person who wrote it as it was was obviously not shown exactly what they were doing. They were just here <laughs> to offer uh, developer support to these two people who had to basically get learn how to build an entire binary of the entire iPod software so they can add software. The only things that the only things that he was aware of is that number one, they were putting extra hardware into it. Number two, that the nature of what they wanted to modify this uh, this iPod to do is to secretly be able to collect readings slash data and save that data onto the hard drive in a way that uh, does not make the iPod look like anything other than a normal iPod. He, oh. he talks he, and he talks about so it how wouldn't be a they, bug. It wouldn't be like listening device. It would be something that you the person carrying it would know that it could do something because he has to return it to get the readings off of it. So that yeah, would make sense. The, maybe a nuclear inspector looking, maybe somebody visiting North Korea, just checking around, seeing what he sees. Yeah, that know. The, the, he's, he, he was speculating that it was a, a, a Geiger counter type of device because it was uh, they were working on a contract for the Department of Energy. That is one of the things that they do. Um, some of the talk back on that article was from people who were kind of in that industry who saying that they're probably less... They're probably simpler ways to achieve the same result, but they, don't, they aren't mentioning what authority they're doing it on. All we all we know is that it was definitely secret. They were uh, the they were talking about how uh, they were asking they would they would do things like ask him like how can I store data on this device in such a way that it wouldn't interfere with the device and no one would be able to see the data. And he said, well, why don't you create a new partition and that way even iTunes wouldn't see this extra partition. It would just be reading as a regular iPod. Oh, that's that's great. That's wonderful. Uh, and the uh, they they weren't. Uh, it was a contract that lasted a couple of months, and then they left, and they didn't come back again. Uh, again, it's the 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 trigger for this apparently was there. The other thing that they're asking about is that we need to be able to activate to turn on the data collection and recording. And they found if they helped them find like some sort of like whatever the deepest sub menu. If you of a listen menu to was. Rick Astley. Never going to give you up. It will <laughs> type in start recording. Type in nine nines, take the integral, and then do a square root. <laughs> I think it's a, it's because it's just a great story. But if you think about it, yeah, if you're going into some facility and you you know you can't carry a Geiger counter or or some yeah. other measuring device, but you could carry a reasonably carry an iPod, and they might look at it, spin the wheel a little bit, see what your musical taste is. But if it looks like a normal iPod, certainly Apple wouldn't build a Geiger counter yeah. into their iPod. Uh, you got free U2 album too, huh? <laughs> I don't want that either. <laughs> How you stop yeah. that? There's there's lots of interesting <laughs> things. Like he was he's also mentioning that this was the model of iPod that they were using was one where it was very easy to take it apart and put it together again without leaving any tooling marks. It was also the last model of iPod, iPod where the soft the, the operating system software was not signed by Apple. So apparently, oh. so evidently that would be a very it would be a very very easy thing for them to do as opposed to the next generation of Apple. Uh, the whole thing is very interesting because it's like I always say the best stories always come when, from people who not only are no longer working. Working for the company, but now they're like ten years out, and now they're thinking they're that well, no, no, no secret that I have now is going to be of any good, of, of any use to anybody. So it's probably okay for me to start talking. If you thought the Untitled Goose Game couldn't get any better, <laughs> you'll be wrong. September twenty third, according to Gamespot, Untitled Goose Game gets two player co-op multiplayer oh. mode <laughs> as it's a uh, play through the whole game with a friend one of you plays the goose one of you plays the other goose and you can carry each other around in a goose box <laughs> I just want to see I want to see Cable Sasser and Stephen Frank just live streaming their adventures in this game <laughs> The, the question is: Do you, as a two-player game, is your do you get to annoy the other player, or is it about doubling up on the humans? I think it's I think choose? it's ganging up. So that's why. Otherwise, why would you have the box so you could sneak it into the farmer's garden without him knowing? Two horrible geese. Local multiplayer coming to all platforms of the Untitled Goose Game. And if you don't have Lori it, and I, I challenge Leo and Andy. It. Yeah, wouldn't that be fun? <laughs> Yes. I hope I, yes. I hope there's like an in-app purchase for like a little horse costume, like where the one duck is the front, <laughs> the other is the back. I would oh, totally be into. Oh, I would totally buy that. That would be so cool. <laughs> Lisa or, or and like I have been looking coat. for some game we could play together. I think it'll be Untitled Goose yes. Game. Yes. 
All right, uh, let's take a break. And then when we come back, your picks of the week. Renee Ritchie, Andy Anako, Lori Gill. And I think this week, given that you haven't spent any of my money recently, Lori, <laughs> I'm going to let you start before these guys get okay. to my wallet. <laughs> what do you got? Are we doing this right now? Yeah, let's do it right now. All right. So uh, my pick of the week is actually from uh, Pad and Quill. I, by um, the way, gorgeous. I, I love Pad and Quill. I bought my uh, iPhone leather iPhone wallet case from Pad and Quill, mm -hmm. and I they really like it. Gorgeous it's cases. Yeah, that yeah. is one of my favorite. That's the Bellafina, right? Yep. And it's got a little, you can get yeah. colored. I get all the colors of the straps. Yeah. <laughs> yep. And it's yep. aging, yep. as I well, would expect, just... aging beautifully because it's beautiful leather and all mm -hmm. that. Because yep. it has a good leather. Yep, yep. it's true. Well, this one isn't leather. This is actually their, um, it kind of looks like a journal notebook. It's called the uh, Cupertina or Copertina, depending on how you want to pronounce it. They have a case for your case. Oh, so I get to keep my magic a, keyboard. Yes. So you can have, you know, a nice protective covering that also makes it kind of look like it's just a book on your shelf if you're trying to hide it, which is like kind of one of the fun things about it. Right. Um, but it works with the, the magic keyboard and your iP uh, iPad Pro. It's magnetic now. So, um, Leo, I know that you know that um, it, most of their products in the past have used um, some version of a sticky right. adhering uh, thing like an M3 strip or something like that. So they are moving on to magnetic now, which I'm very excited about. I actually have the Cupertina that does not include the um, the support for the Magic Keyboard. So it's it's the thinner one, the, the no keyboard version. And I love that it's magnetic instead of sticky because it's much easier to pull off. The, the great thing about those sticky strips is that they can pull off. But, you know, you kind of have to yank on it a little bit. It takes a minute. Being magnetic, just like whoop, you just whip it right off it's, and, you know, stick it on another case or put it back in. So it's magnetic. It works with the Magic Keyboard. It's relatively inexpensive. And it's made by a great quality company that makes fantastic products. So I think you may have just spent your money. <laughs> yeah, I think you got me. I wish they had it. For, they only have it for the 11. No, they do have it for the 12.9. It's you actually have to go to. I think you would um, go, go back. to their uh, yeah, yeah, iPad accessories page. I just followed their link, your link, rather. And, yeah. Uh, so iPad Pro leather cases, iPad Pro cases and accessories. All right, yeah, because this is nice. And I love it that it kind of looks like a book. Um, mm -hmm. There it is, yeah, for the iPad 12.9, $109. Bucks. Mm -hmm. Unless you want a pocket. You can get an internal pocket. For ten dollars, which is a, a nice little thing to have a little pocket yeah. in there. I like the gray linen. I like the charcoal. I can't decide. Oh well, mm -hmm. nice. You know what I like about it is I always feel like the 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 keyboard isn't really a case, and I don't. I'm worried about it. It's getting mine's is already getting. You want to protect up. that? Yes. Yeah. I, I know spent exactly three hundred fifty bucks on it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I want to protect the case that protects the case. <laughs> Uh, that's padandquill.com. Andy Anako, pick of the week. Uh, I'm calling an audible and saying that because we were talking about this lovely Star Wars jacket, there are a bunch of different, like, licensed and unlicensed Etsy creators that make really, really great reproductions of, like, the really good jackets you see, like, in the movies. Uh, there is a site called, for instance, for the, uh, uh for the, uh, Han Solo, uh, Force Awakens jacket, you can go to fjackets.com. Uh, they make a really, really good version of that made out of, like, real leather. Uh, it's a not terribly spendy it's like 189 i think uh but it's available in like all kinds of different sizes it allows you it's fully lined it's not it's not a costume piece it's designed to be like an actual wearable article of clothing uh other sites like um there's uh, one site that i found uh on i think it's, it's an etsy store yeah it's an etsy store called uh lucas jacket designs <laughs> actually i think they had to call they had to rename it luca jackets designs uh that makes <laughs> knockoffs knock my name is of luca star wars i didn't direct star wars yeah i know that <laughs> it luca. was saved in editing <laughs> uh yeah <laughs> there but not but not only like star wars you can get like uh, you can get uh, uh spider-man jackets you can get jackets from uh from uh, uh riverdale from uh, you can get there is a there is a uh there is a couple of jackets that like kind of like 
want and I'm trying to tell myself that don't spend $190 on impulse uh, but the uh, the bat the, the purple and yellow uh, batgirl leather jacket uh, from like the reboot when she became like sort of a hipster in the the Brooklyn version of uh, of, of Gotham City that's $199 uh, the it's really really nice stuff, and I've, I've I've seen some of these jackets like in the wild, particularly at Comic Con. And the great thing is that you can be a foot away from them, and they don't they don't look like they are like prop jackets or that they're fandom jackets. It looks like you went into a store, bought something that was made to be worn. Uh, a, fr a friend of mine, uh, my, my best friend, had bought from the from the Lucasfilm fan club when we were kids. Bought like the fan club version of the Luke Skywalker Bespin Cloud. City jacket from Empire Strikes Back. And I made fun of him for it because when he got it, it was just like polyester and was unlined and didn't have working pockets. But he did wear it for like three three uh, uh, autumns and winters and it held up. But these are actually more practical like daily wear jackets. And they seem silly until they become your daily wear and then you kind of don't want to be without them. Uh, is it real leather? I mean, is this wow? These some of them nice. are some of them are real leather. You have to find out. You have to you have to look carefully. Some of them are uh, pleather. I'm not going to say vegan leather because vegan leather is just plastic, uh, which, which is fine. Which is fine if you don't want to use leather. Just make sure that you realize that it's not. Ooh, miraculously they found something that wears exactly like leather, but is actually vegan. No, it is. It's still going to be like a form of vinyl. So you're going to sweat like a like a dog in an unventilated uh, basement uh, when you're wearing it. But some of them have real leather, some of them aren't. Some of these are but, beautiful, yeah. like this Star-Lord uh, trench jacket. Yeah, wow. exactly. That's, that's fancy. That, that's, that's, that's one of the things I love about like modern uh, modern like uh, uh, comic book and science fiction movies. The wardrobe is not is, uh, they, they're not trying to make like a, they're not going to give you the, the, the version of the Wolverine jacket that they made for the comic book where it's garish and colorful and unwearable. They will make a version of it for the movie that looks like an actual practical wearable right. item and if you look right. closely there is like sort of an x sort of motif and how it's stitched uh, and a lot of the stuff is like that you can you can you can wear uh, you you can absolutely wear the han solo jacket because you think it's a very you you admired it as a middle-aged person <laughs> i said wow he, he's he's older he's like 30 years older than i am and he looks really really good in that leather jacket maybe i should buy one and you could actually buy that and wear it and nobody will know that you're wearing a nerd sort of replica prop sort of jacket. This is this is what I like about the way that they these people in these Etsy shops oh. uh, that they do they they try to make them they they do I they make whatever changes they have to make in order to make I them. Found work. your jacket, Lori. <laughs> the, oh. Yes, I know. I saw that. Baba <laughs> Fett. Yeah, oh. I love those colors. Oh yeah, baby. Yeah, this yeah. yeah, baby. This looks good. Yeah, you should have a little looks, little flap does. there on your shoulder so you could just you know in case they want ID, <laughs> just flip that up there. Wow, look at Donkey Kong, a Donkey Kong uh, bomber jacket. <laughs> this is amazing. They have a huge amount. This must be like yeah, a company. This is not some guy working out of his garage. Yeah, but but also even but I should say that these are just a couple that I singled out. There even the people who are working out of their garage. The thing is, like there there are these uh, there are these clothing makers that they're fans. They are making replicas, and all they do is make the is make the uh, like the the the, the best in, the best bin Cloud City jacket. And they've been researching it for like twenty years. And every two or three years, they change their patterning. So it's oftentimes when you do have this mm -hmm. one person in their garage or in their sewing room, you will get this most incredible piece of tailored clothing you have ever seen in your life that is far beyond like what you would ever find in a store commercially made because they're each individually handmade and that this person wanted to get the best the Boba Fett jacket, the best Han Solo jacket, and that's all they ever focused on because they were making one for themselves and they realized that if they're going to be able to like f <laughs> fund this for themselves, they're going to have to, be, they're gonna, maybe they'll make seven or eight instead of just one and therefore they'll get their jacket for free or at least they'll only lose $80 on it <laughs> yeah and when you go to uh comic-con you don't want to be wearing something that's not absolutely authentic look at yep. that this is kind of a neat jacket i don't know what i don't know what i guess is i don't know who junk rat is in overwatch but i'll uh i'll wear it that sounds you good do now i do now man renee ritchie pick of the week uh so 
First, I have just a, a quick opening statement, Leo, and that is Facebook has just <laughs> announced that they're going to start requiring Facebook logins to use Oculus on new devices. <gasps> Previously, oh, when you shame. bought an Oculus, you had the choice not For to use Facebook shame. but to use an Oculus login. And apparently going forward, that would no longer be the case. So like you said, in my best Game of Thrones, exhausted <laughs> and annoyed expression, just, yes, yeah, shame, 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 shame. Just can you not? Ugh. I've had enough of 2020. Can you uh, not? So, uh, yeah, let's mm. just put a lot of pressure on them and hope they see the light that not everyone who wants an Oculus wants Facebook. There. Okay. <laughs> Disappointing. Um, my second thing is I just wanted to give a shout out because I think it's super important right now. And a lot of people don't realize this as crazy it is for those of us inside the business that there's not just genius bars and Apple stores, but there's Apple care. And I've been contacted a couple times recently, but just uh, someone on Twitter reached out to me, actually someone on Discord reached out to me and let me know like just all the work that Apple care is doing right now. If you have a problem with your device. It's not Apple Care Plus. It's not the insurance part. It's the online and on the phone and all the other support people who, because the stores aren't active right now, at least many people don't have access to an Apple store or a genius bar, but you can go to the Apple Care page at uh, Apple. There's one for all the different regions that Apple operates in and they have chat support and they have telephone support, they have, they have email support, I think as well. Um, and you can tell them what your problem is. You can get help with it. If you're if you're still under warranty, I believe all the help is free. If not, there might be an incident charge the same way there is when you go to an Apple store and you're not covered by warranty. But a lot of the people there are super smart. I know a lot of people uh, just in, in the industry that we work in who used to for a while work in Apple Care, and they are some seriously, seriously smart people. And, uh, you know, the, the quality always varies from one to one. You can always hang up and try again if you want to re-roll the dice on your Apple Care support person. But in my experience, they're super knowledgeable. They really try to help you. They do start off, you know, with the scripts. They do escalate, all that sort of thing. But if you are stuck at home, if your local store is not open, if you are having problems, if Google search and asking on Twitter, if all that stuff doesn't help and you just want to contact Apple, Apple cares. They make it they couldn't make it easier for you to get through to them. Nice. So please do. Please do. They need the money. They're suffering. <laughs> help those Poor little people working. Well, it's, it's more all the people day. who have the problems who would normally like. It's like we know how to do that. Well, we don't always know, but we know how to ask. Right. But a lot of people, they just <laughs> are used to going to their local Apple store and talking to the it's genius, true. and they don't know what to do right now. I uh, I never buy oh. Apple Care, but if you if you need it, get it. I guess well, I, you get it for free for the first year. Like right. you know, almost all jurisdictions, you get a whole year of it, and you should make use of it. Take advantage I mean, of it. It's part I of what agree. you paid for. Yeah, I agree. Yep. Mm -hmm. uh, ladies and gentlemen, that concludes this thrilling and gripping edition of Mecca Break a Weekly. Renee Ritchie is on YouTube at Renee Ritchie and covers all of the stuff, everything that we talk about here and more. What are you working on these days? What's your latest? I just spent a ridiculous amount of time putting together what was originally like a 40 minute video. Now it's down to 25 minutes on everything you need to know about where all the bones, are, the bodies are buried between Apple and Epic. <laughs> Um, and then I'm gonna <laughs> then I'm gonna shift over to uh, talking about fall products tomorrow. Oh, exciting! So just all the videos, yeah. So you're getting out uh, almost one a day now at this point. I, I'm slowing down temporarily because I have another project I want to launch, and it's, it's going to take a little bit of time. So I was doing four videos a week. Now I'm dropping down. I think. Like the news is just crazy, so I might change that, but I'm going to drop down to three, I think, for the next couple of weeks. It's kind of nice when you're doing something like this where you feel prompted to do one. Like you don't have to, yes. oh, what am I going to talk about today? But like, I got to talk about this. Oh, I this. love it. I'm super yeah. excited. Yeah. yeah. Like I could yeah. not be happier making these videos. Yeah, yeah. Good job. YouTube.com slash Renee Ritchie. Andy Anako, when will you be on GBH Boston? next uh looks like i'm gonna be on my usual day and time uh friday at 1 p.m tune into uh, uh wgbhnews.org uh, to stream it live or later and thank you and of course Lori gill uh, managing editor at imore what are you working on today um a review of an imac <laughs> <laughs> you got that new imac that's uh, that's awesome yeah, there, yeah. I'll, I'll have a review up on the site in in the next couple of days with my my opening thoughts on it for sure and then, you like it you know i'll i'll play around with it for a while and give you some more info yeah, yeah it's i mean it, it's an imac you know right other than the very major changes which is the the, the new webcam and the matte screen on this particular model um you're just 
seeing speed differences. It's still just an iMac, but my favorite iMac is the is the twenty seven inch iMac. My favorite oh, Mac of all the entire line, desktop and desktop. Yeah, I so love my iMac. It's Pro. really nice. I love it. Like, mm -hmm. like a yeah, woman. So good. <laughs> I love it. I want to <laughs> hug it and kiss it. No, mm -hmm. it's great. It's a really nice uh, system. Can't wait to get the new Apple Silicon one. Yeah. A mm -hmm. couple of years. Thank you, Lori, Renee, Andy. Thank you all for being here. We do Mac Break Weekly on Tuesdays right after iOS today. Around right about 11 a.m. Pacific, 2 p.m. Eastern Time, 1800 UTC. If you want to watch uh, live, you can all you have to do is go to twit.tv slash live. There's live audio and video there. You can get on-demand versions of the website, twit.tv slash mbw. Or maybe the best thing to do would be to subscribe in your favorite podcatcher. That way you'll get it the minute it's available of a Tuesday afternoon. Um, we'll see you next week. Thanks, everybody. Now time to get back to work because break time is over. Bye-bye. I'm Jason Howell, host of Tech News Weekly here on Twit.tv, along with my co-host, Micah Sargent. Each and every week, we talk to people who are making and breaking the tech news. It could be journalists writing amazing tech stories. It could be experts. It could be the sources of the stories themselves, developers, you name it. We bring them onto the show, and we talk to them about why their story is resonating with the world. You can watch and subscribe by going to twit.tv slash TNW. Make sure you do that. You won't miss a single episode. We'll see you there.